Introduction to Our Journey to Sinai. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Our Journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. Introduction. We were quite young, only just married, when we first planned to visit the lands of the Bible together. We read the accounts of Eastern travelers. We bought maps and guidebooks. We saluted each other with Bedouin phrases and gestures. My husband had been for some time an eager student of Oriental customs and languages. Thirty years later he had become one of the first scholars in Europe. Yet that early desire had not been fulfilled. The education of our children, stress of work, lack of money, the many changes and chances of this mortal life had kept us at home. In the spring of 1892, Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. Gibson, two Scottish ladies known as great travelers, brought from the convent of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai wonderful accounts and photographs of early biblical manuscripts especially of a Syriac palimpsest of most venerable appearance. In olden times, before the invention of paper mill and printing press, most books were written on parchment, a preparation of goat or sheepskin. This being expensive and not always easy to get, industrious writers were sometimes driven to use what we might now be inclined to call waste paper, they took an old book which they did not care to read any longer, or of which they possessed several copies. They scrubbed and scraped the writing off the leathern leaves, and then proceeded to write their new book on the old pages. But their predecessors had used very good ink, which could not be entirely effaced, and we can often trace the earlier writing in faint yellow marks between the lines and even between the words and letters of the later work. Such a doubly filled volume is called a palimpsest. In the early summer months, Professor Bensley's time was fully occupied with university business, but in the long vacation, he carefully examined the photographs brought by Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. Gibson, in company with his friend and former pupil, Mr. F. C. Burkett of Trinity College. I sat in the room where the two scholars, with their heads close together, were deciphering some of the underwriting, and I well remember their exclamations of gladness and triumph when they found it to contain the earliest Syriac translation of our Gospels, made in the second century, and known hitherto only from fragments and quotations. Though the evangelists wrote in Greek, Syriac was the native language of our Lord and his disciples, and whenever the actual words of Christ are quoted, epitha, talitha cum, eli, eli lama sabachthani, they are not in Greek, but in Syriac, or rather in Aramaic, of which Syriac is a dialect. This early version, then, is invaluable as giving us more nearly than perhaps any other writing the very sound of the words which our Lord uttered. Both Mr. Bensley and Mr. Burkett saw that it would be impossible to recover more than a few lines here and there from the photographs alone. They at once resolved to go and see the original. Their wives claimed the privilege of accompanying them. The ladies above mentioned volunteered to go a second time to assist the party with their experience in Eastern travel and with their knowledge of modern Greek, the language of the monks on Sinai. And the six travelers arranged to start about Christmas, the early part of the year being the most favorable season for crossing the desert. A seventh traveler, a friend of Mrs. Lewis, Mr. Rendell Harris of Clare College, joined us later on at Suez. We all felt the importance of the undertaking. We all valued the privilege of assisting, in some way, at the recovery of such a treasure. To my husband and myself, this journey was also the realization of early dreams, 
the fulfillment of a never-quite-forgotten fancy. And now, as I sit in darkness and solitude, and remember the wonderful time, so different from the even tenor of our English lives, it seems to recede again into the realms of romance. I think of the boundless freedom of the desert, of its golden light and eternal sunshine. I listen to the sound of falling waters and to the waving of the palm trees, where I wander hand in hand with my beloved. And I hardly know, is it a dream of the past? Is it a vision of the future? But now to business, for this book is intended to give a practical account of our journey to Sinai, how we bestrode our camels, how we ate and drank and slept in the desert, how we settled in the convent garden, climbed to the top of the holy mountain, and finally carried home in our saddlebags the hard-won transcription of the great palimpsest. End of introduction. Chapter One of Our Journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter One Cairo. At home it was midwinter when we, in warm and sunny weather, arrived at Cairo at the far-famed Shepherd's Hotel. It was full of travelers from all parts of the world, and many of them made it, like ourselves, a welcome resting place before going further south or east, and enjoyed from its broad terrace their first full view of Oriental life by watching the moving panorama of the street below. It was like a scene from the Arabian Nights revived for our benefit, as we reclined in comfortable rocking chairs under the large awning in front of the hotel and leisurely sipped our afternoon tea. On the pavement close to the terrace wall squatted a row of porters, each on his own little mat. Their legs were bare, but their heads carefully wrapped in bright-colored turbans. Motionless they sat. The smoke from their pipes was the only sign of life but the landlord calls, and instantly, with loud vociferations, a dozen brown arms are fighting for the letter in his hand. The conqueror hides it in the bosom of his long blue shirt, his only visible garment, and is lost in the crowd. The others return contentedly to bask in sunshine and tobacco smoke. Two handsome fellows in white tunics with flowing sleeves and gold-embroidered vests run abreast at full speed along the middle of the road. They are the forerunners of a great man's carriage. Here it is, a big, burly, moody-faced boy in semi-European attire, sits by the side of an elderly mentor. It is the young Khedive. The crowd halts for a moment and salutes the sovereign by touching brow and breast with the fingers of the right hand. A few devout subjects prostrate themselves, with the face to the ground as in the mosque when the name of Allah is mentioned. He is gone, returning to his mother's country residence from his daily visit to the official palace in Cairo. Now native soldiers march past with their band led by an English officer. Whatever these sons of the desert may think of drill and confinement, evidently they are proud of their smart uniform and enjoy the martial strains of the music. A Greek priest in black gown and high cylindrical cap makes his way with downcast eyes to cloister or cathedral, seemingly unobserved by the multitude. A dark-skinned policeman, who seems hardly at home in his tight coat and trousers, pats a riotous nigger gently on the back, coaxing him to move on to a more convenient spot. He looks fierce enough to bully any foreign traveler, but cannot speak roughly to his African brother. A wealthy merchant bound for his place in the bazaar trots along on a swift-footed white donkey with trappings of purple velvet. The little black servant boy runs behind, out of breath, but thinks it is his duty to whack the donkey each time he gets near enough to reach it with his stick. Hindu ayahs, daintily dressed in Indian embroideries, with jeweled rings in nose and underlip, 
lead their fair nurslings carefully through the crowd. The native women are covered and veiled from head to foot by the yashmak, a long navy blue cloak. It is fastened above the nose by a curious brass ornament and leaves only the dark eyes and darker eyebrows visible. Some of them have been marketing and carry large flat baskets with fruit and vegetables on their heads. One of them has her naked little baby sitting astride on her shoulder. It clutches the mother's draperies with its curling toes and sticky little fingers and sucks composedly a bit of sugar cane the usual bonbon of Egyptian children. Alas, its pretty brown face is besmeared with the sweet juice and almost covered by flies. Every kind of commodity is offered for sale in the street, one always in louder and shriller tones than the other. There are the water carriers, with heavy stone jars on their heads, or with water skins in the shape of little black pigs, slung across their backs. There are vendors of lemonade with shining tin cans and pannikins, pastry cooks with trays full of bright colored sweetmeats, women laden with bananas and oranges, and the Bedouin from the desert who carry palm nuts and dates in the capacious sleeves of their burnous. These appeal chiefly to the natives, while brass trays and Persian rugs, ostrich feathers and bamboo canes, basket work and pottery from the Sudan, relics from the ancient tombs, and roses fresh gathered from the Sultana's gardens are cried and held before the face of every man or woman in modern attire. The most noisy and numerous of all the people in the road are the donkey boys and the beggars. Every donkey boy is, of course, accompanied by his donkey. These African animals differ much from their English brethren. Taller and stronger, with neatly shaped heads and docile manners, they are generally well fed and groomed, at least in Cairo, where everybody seems to ride them, and where they are largely kept for the benefit of the tourists. Their owners, bright little urchins in cotton shirts and white skull caps, introduce them to every decently dressed foot passenger each of them as the quickest and cleverest donkey in Cairo, and vary their names from the native Ali or Omar to Bismarck, Napoleon, or Grand Old Man, according to the nationality of the coveted customer. The beggars, old or young, blind or sighted, crippled or able-bodied, half-naked or jealously hidden under the dirtiest of blankets and rags, never cease from stretching forth their hands and from uttering their cry of back sheesh they squat in every sunny corner and besiege every stranger whom they can reasonably suppose to carry loose piastres in his pocket it is wonderful to see how the arab drivers steer their light open carriages safely through this living stream indeed they increase the general din by the shrillest of warnings but the very frequency of their shouts tends to make them unheeded. In this motley crowd, the residents and visitors from Western Europe would look incongruous in their somber attire had they not already somewhat conformed to the Oriental taste for brightness and color by wearing Syrian sashes and by tying gaily striped or snow-white kufijas around their hats. Moreover, all government officials from the Khedive down to the lowest clerk, wear, indoors and out of doors, the red fez or Turkish cap, ornamented by a long blue tassel, whether their other garments are Egyptian or European. There are many such hybrid costumes, black coats and red caps, for this neighborhood of Shepherd's Hotel is, after all, but modern Cairo. The street is wide, well paved and drained, the houses are built in French fashion, and the shops managed like those of Paris or London. Old Cairo, the city of the caliphs, must be sought in the native quarter, in its coffee houses, mosques, and bazaars. Often during the following weeks did we wander down the Muski, the chief commercial road of the old town, 
escorted each time by a number of importunate boys, genuine little street Arabs, who wanted us to ride on their donkeys, offered to show us the way, and poured no end of information into our ears. We preferred to go on foot. We required no guide. We understood little of their language, and we gave them no back sheesh, yet we never got quite rid of their clamor and their company. The street was narrow, the pavement execrable, and cleanliness an unknown luxury, yet we easily forgot these drawbacks under the magic influence of the lux ex orient that illumined all our surroundings. The upper stories project from both sides of the way, so that only a slender strip of dark blue sky is visible above. The old Moorish doorways are more or less richly ornamented by carved scrolls and painted texts from the Koran. The windows are few and far between, and all covered by screens or blinds of curiously carved fretwork, admitting air and light, but guarding the fair inmates from every inquisitive eye. The chief rooms all open towards inner courts and galleries, and now and then, when one of the heavy doors opened to admit a water carrier or a silk merchant, we caught glimpses of cool greenery and sparkling fountains within. The ladies are seldom seen in the street, closely veiled and jealously guarded, but the men seem to transact all their business out of doors. We watched a scribe who had established himself with his carpet and writing tablet in a quiet corner. His inkhorn was safely stuck in his belt as he listened to the whispers of two veiled females who leant over his shoulders and looked with amazement at the mystic signs of the reed pen that were to convey their messages of love or jealousy to some distant friend. Further on in a little square, an eager crowd had collected round a native conjurer. Without any of the tools and trappings seen at a modern juggler's performances, he sat down on a piece of matting in full daylight and began by producing young chickens from his mouth and serpents from his ears. The creatures he manipulated and changed and multiplied in a most bewildering manner, and I do not know who admired him most the Arabs, who believed him to be a great magician inspired by Allah, or we, who had never seen such skill and cleverness as he displayed in these inexplicable tricks. Close to him, in front of a barber's shop, hair cutting and shaving were going on in public, and here we saw for the first time the bare head of a true Mohammedan, almost clean-shaven, but with a long tuft of hair at the back, the coffee shops, all open and overflowing into the roadway, were always full of loungers, who reclined on carpets and cushions, and enjoyed the mixed flavor of tobacco and coffee. Some five or six of them would sit in a circle on the ground and play a kind of dominoes, or else listen spellbound to one of their professional storytellers. Our children were never more charmed with their nursery tales than these grave, black-bearded men with the fables and legends that are thus related to them. In this same street are several small mosques, frequented chiefly by the lower classes. Their slender minarets and more imposing doorways distinguish otherwise bare walls from the surrounding houses. These minarets are not unlike our lighthouses in shape. They are crowned at the top by a little cupola and a round gallery from which the muezzins, who in England would be called church clerks, call the faithful to prayer at fixed hours throughout the day. We had heard and read so much about these calls to prayer that we were disappointed how little notice they attracted among the people. Now and then we saw a true believer who prostrated himself and recited his prayers at the precise time of noon or sunset, whether in the open desert or in the crowded city, but this was an exception from the general rule. It may be that the winter, when Cairo is flooded by strangers, is not the most favorable season for the display of native piety. At least, one of the boys tried to explain this in his broken English. Now, very much stranger, 
very much donkey wanted, no time for prayer. In summer, no work, no bakshish, very much prayer, very much mosque. Yet even now we never found a mosque quite empty. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. The prayer carpet that covers the greater part of the floor in every mosque represents this holy ground to the Mohammedans. In the alabaster mosque of the Khedive, and in other wealthy places, it consists of the best and costliest fabrics, but in poorer quarters it is of matting only, and sometimes sadly dilapidated. But no dusty shoe nor travel-stained foot is allowed to touch it. Before entering, all worshippers take off their shoes and wash hands and feet in the nearest fountain. Most mosques have one of their own in a shady court or just inside the gate. Some of the men carry a towel in their sleeve. Others come forward and kneel down with bright drops glistening on their bronze-colored limbs. They repeat their prayers in a rhythmical kind of undertone, swinging the body gently to and fro, as if to keep time with the voice, and touching the ground at intervals with the palms of their hands and their forehead. They look neither to the right nor to the left, and go out as quietly as they came in. There seem to be no special time or form of service, but we generally heard overhead the measured tones of a reader who recited parts of the Koran. A few years ago, all visitors had to take off their shoes at the entrance. There is now an innovation in the shape of large straw slippers, which an attendant tied over our boots. We were then allowed to enter, but it was a clumsy contrivance. The knotted strings would get undone, and we had to stand on one leg until the slipper was readjusted. Not a reverential proceeding, but it may have saved us from a cold in the head. Though all pictures, even representations of flowers and foliage, are strictly forbidden, the fashionable mosques are most beautifully decorated. The quaint shapes of the Arabic letters lend themselves easily to graceful patterns for scrolls and panels, and texts from the Koran, in mosaic of gold and precious stones, cover great part of the walls, while colored marbles, silken hangings, and hundreds of silver lamps complete the rest. But here we found the interiors somewhat dark and desolate. The Qibla, or prayer niche, in the direction of Mecca, towards which the worshippers bow, is a plain, door-shaped recess in the wall. There is also a kind of balcony for the reader, a screened gallery for the women, and sometimes the tomb of the saint or benefactor that gives his name to the place, a cubicle of stone with a low entrance, covered inside and outside with tinseled pieces of cloth. Yet there can be no greater contrast than between the cool quietude of these little mosques and the noisy excitement of the neighboring bazaars. An incredible amount of merchandise is here heaped up in a comparatively small space, for these bazaars are not, as one might suppose, wide market places, but very narrow lanes that cross and meet and intersect each other in every possible angle and direction, forming a labyrinth in which we lost ourselves for hours together, returning repeatedly without knowing it to the same spot but finding there always new objects of interest. Each lane is devoted to a particular branch of industry or commerce. There is a silk bazaar, a brass bazaar, a carpet bazaar, and so on. The overhanging houses nearly meet at the top, where strips of carpet, tent cloths, and palm branches are stretched from roof to roof to keep out the sun. In England, such a contrivance would leave the traders in darkness, but under the bright sky of Egypt, where clouds are almost unknown, light is abundant. The lower parts of the houses form a continuous row of small open shops, apparently without front walls. They are separated from the roadway only by a threshold 
covered by cushions and carpets. Here the merchant reclines, and here the customer sits down by his side. Sometimes we found the former engaged in reading the Koran. If so, he would quietly finish his verse or his chapter before betaking himself to business. But these Arabs are born traders, and know how to get a good bargain out of the unwary traveler. One wants more time and experience than we possessed to buy anything at its true value. They always began by asking three or four times the legitimate price. We answered by offering somewhat less than we intended to give, and a long discussion then followed, which ended in meeting halfway, and in our paying at least double what we ought to have spent. When one of the dealers had imposed on us more than his elastic conscience would allow, he graciously offered us a little present an embroidered mat, or a flagon with a drop of rose oil. I possess several of these keepsakes, which remind me of pleasant hours spent in the bazaars, but also of the facility with which we were gulled. Within this network of narrow passages and blind alleys are also, here and there, larger courts and halls secluded by high walls from the turmoil without, with richly carved gateways, balconies, and fountains, probably the remains of ancient mosques and palaces. These are now used as warehouses by the wealthier merchants. We visited one of them several times. He was a dealer in carpets, a fine old man in a long caftan of purple silk trimmed with fur and costly embroidery. His place had once formed part of a mosque, the women's gallery was now occupied by his clerks and accountants, and the beautiful Moorish arches and the dark walls above were covered with the richest of oriental hangings and rugs. Heavy rolls of the same fabrics were ranged all around, forming luxurious divans, where we sat by his side, conversing amicably as well as people can do who understand little or nothing of each other's language about the weather, the influx of strangers, and the rising of the Nile. An attendant in spotless white brought coffee in little cups of most delicate china, and the host handed us an ivory box of sweets. Nothing was said of buying or selling, but his servants unrolled carpet after carpet before our eyes, and spread them at our feet until the floor of the vast apartment was covered with a two- or threefold layer of the softest colors and textures. Once or twice we timidly asked the price of a specially bewitching prayer carpet. It was too high. We could not hope to bring it by the longest discussion within the limits of our purse. But though we came again and again to admire and not to buy, we were always received with the same dignified courtesy. From sunrise to sunset, these bazaars are full of buyers and sightseers, of natives and foreigners, of men, women, and donkeys, shouting and braying and pushing three abreast through passages where there seems hardly room for one. But at nightfall, the crowds disappear, gaily caparisoned donkeys take the owners home to their harem. Busy servants put up folding doors and shutters, and the poor watchmen lie down on the pavement outside their master's door. Here they spend the night, simply wrapped in blankets, looking like bundles of old clothes, or ensconced in narrow, coffin-shaped baskets. No doubt they sleep soundly, but only across their bodies could an entrance be effected. Here below, the native element still reigns undisturbed, but the old citadel above is entirely in the hands of the English. From the last steep spur of the Mokadam Hills it dominates the town, and affords at the same time a beautiful view over the surrounding country. At the foot of the hill stands the old mosque of Sultan Hassan, the stateliest mosque in all Egypt, but now 
forsaken and left to decay in honor of its modern successor on the summit, inferior in every way except in its clothing of gold and alabaster. We drove up by the wide carriage road that is now preferred to the narrow passage between high walls, formerly the only available approach, where the unhappy Mamelukes were surprised as in a trap and massacred to the last man by order of Mehemet Ali, when returning from a banquet in the citadel. The tall figures and fair faces of the English sentinels who now stood at the gates and took our cards were pleasant to behold, and the quiet demeanor of the soldiers who loitered on the newly washed pavement of the parade ground, in their cool undress, fell in agreeably with the fresh breezes from the west, after the heat and dust of the streets below. There at our feet lay the vast city, its yellow-gray walls, sandstone from the Mokadam hills, unstained by smoke or damp, spread out like a map, with its flat roofs and innumerable minarets, with its palaces and gardens, and beyond it the fruitful valley of Egypt and the sacred river Nile, winding away into the distance with its white-winged sailing boats, looking from afar like so many seagulls skimming the waves. A low range of hills bounded the view towards the east, but the sands of the desert gleamed on the western horizon, and there, dark and sharply defined against the golden sunset sky, rose the familiar shapes of the pyramids, so familiar from nursery books and Bible pictures, from drawings and paintings of every kind. We could hardly believe that this was not another picture, but reality itself. It fascinated our eyes. Again and again we turned to those wonders of the world, we gazed until the shades of evening fell and the gates of the citadel had to be closed. We felt that we could not leave Egypt without having seen the pyramids face to face. So very early one morning, my husband and myself took our places on the top of the coach that plied daily between Cairo and Giza, a distance of twelve or fourteen miles. Four quick horses took us quickly through the busy streets, to the long bridge over the Nile. It is flanked at both ends by large gates with heavy stone lions on the head of the piers. These gates are shut for two hours about noon when the incessant traffic from shore to shore slackens a little during the heat of the day, and the bridge itself is then opened for the sake of the shipping. The ancient river was at its best, not overflowing all the low-lying lands, as in August and September, nor leaving its sandbanks and shallows bare, as in March and April, but a broad, powerful stream, reflecting the palaces and gardens on its bank, and alive with steamers, sailing and rowing boats of every possible build and destination. Just above the bridge, some of Cook's floating hotels, that take every winter thousands of visitors up to the cataracts, were flying their pennons. On the opposite side, the graceful dahabiyas, private houseboats, were ranged along the shore, waiting for the north wind to take them up to Luxor and Filey for their sunny holiday on the blue waters. We had already boarded several of them, whose owners we knew, and had admired the taste and ingenuity that make these temporary homes so cozy and comfortable. The upper decks especially, with their awnings and carpets, with their bamboo lounges and tropical flower stands, form the most attractive of drawing rooms. They differ much in size and style, from the white and gold summer palace of the Khedive to the snug little boat belonging to the American mission. But they are all alike in shape, long and slender, with high slanting yards and huge three-cornered sails, and they carry invariably at the stern their own provision boat with a large hen coop full of fowls and one solitary sheep. Down the middle of the stream float lazily the native market boats, clumsy-looking, almost square and heavily laden with cattle and corn, or 
piled halfway up the mast with fruit and vegetables. Larger cargo boats take foreign merchandise up and bring down the sugar from the huge manufactories on the upper Nile. The swift little mail steamers with the half moon flying at the masthead provide for the postal and passenger traffic throughout the length of the land, and innumerable neat sailing and rowing boats flit up and down and from shore to shore. The sailors lie lazily smoking on the sunny deck, and the rowers time their work to a low, monotonous chant. In a village near the further end of the bridge a kind of fair was going on, and for the next half hour, as we drove along the high embankment by the side of the river, we met a continuous stream of market people, with strings of camels and donkeys carrying their country produce to the capital. We met picturesque family groups, father, mother, and children on the same camel, together with a live sheep and sundry fowls held lovingly in the children's arms. Other parties went on foot, urging on their poor, overburdened donkey, while some had to carry their bundles and baskets themselves, when the heaviest load would always be laid on the head of the woman. We passed the entrance to the princely gardens of Giza. The palace, with its lofty halls and galleries, is now the museum for the treasures of ancient Egypt. Here, after four thousand years' rest in their rocky graves, are deposited in glass cases, the mummies of the pharaohs and the golden ornaments of Queen Hatasu. Here the walls are all covered with bas-reliefs and inscriptions taken from temples and tombs and revealing to us their religion and history. And here, among flowering shrubs, is the grave of the great explorer Mariette, guarded by four of his favorite sphinxes. Soon after passing the palace gates, we left the river and entered the beautiful avenue of lebec trees, thornless acacias, that leads in a straight line from the Nile to the pyramids. On both sides lay fruitful fields of corn and clover. Villages and farmsteads, surrounded almost hidden by high eucalyptus trees, herds of kine and buffaloes, stood more than knee-deep in the rich pastures, and droves of camels unattended crossed our road. The canals were still full from the last inundation, and water wheels were at work on all sides to fill the rivulets that intersect the fields in every direction. The road was in excellent order, and the ride altogether delightful, but its interest centered in the view of the pyramids ahead. Hidden now and then by intervening trees, they seemed to have gained in size each time they reappeared until the coach drew up at the foot of the natural platform on which these giant mausoleums rise. At the very edge of the desert lies a little plateau, about a mile square and nowhere higher than 100 feet. This was the burial ground of the great 6,000 years ago. Here stood seven or eight pyramids and several other sanctuaries, while the ground itself was honeycombed by temples and tomb chambers cut in the solid rock. They were used as quarries by the Turks in building the mosques and palaces of Cairo, or overwhelmed and filled up by the shifting sands of the desert. But the two largest pyramids have braved storms and depredations, and from a little distance look almost intact, though their outer covering of polished stone is gone except a little piece at the very top and innumerable large blocks have been torn away from around the base, some of them still strewing the ground, half covered in rubbish and sand. The impression of power which the pyramids make upon the beholder must not be measured by their height alone, which is, after all, not much greater than the cathedrals of Strasbourg and Cologne. The area which they cover, and the massiveness of their construction, must be considered. We rested and lunched in the shadow of the Pyramid of Cheops, and we were almost painfully oppressed by its grandeur. But more surprising still than the size of the pyramids was to us 
that of the great sphinx which lies a few hundred yards to the south now almost entirely freed from its covering of sand it once held a temple between its gigantic paws and some of the votive inscriptions can still be read on the ruins below seen close at hand the head of the sphinx is little more than an unshapen mass of rock but we watched it from afar in the quiet evening light until we saw dawning in the marred and battered features their ancient expression of awful solemnity the walls of the newly excavated tombs are covered with bas reliefs and inscriptions as sharp and clear as if fresh from the chisel but the sarcophagi the images of the gods and the sacrificial tables are now preserved in the museum at giza we took tea with a friend who was staying at mina house the beautiful hotel at the foot of the pyramids and the coachman's horn sounded all too soon my only outward memorial of this day is a small photograph taken by the same kind friend it represents the learned professor and his homely wife with the awful background of pyramid and sphinx we stayed three weeks at cairo not half long enough to see much less to learn all it has to show and to teach but we were only pilgrims passing through and would not have delayed so long had not the necessary preparations for our ride across the desert kept us back from day to day. End of chapter 1「Preparations」Our first business after arriving in Cairo was to look for a trustworthy dragoman, interpreter, and guide. We were soon besieged by applicants. Without special letters of introduction, they were not allowed to enter the hotel itself. But no sooner did we come out on the terrace than they got a hold of us. If we sat down, they took the next chair. If we went out, they walked by our side along the road. They brought from out their sleeves a formidable array of testimonials, spread them on the nearest table, or, if more convenient, on the pavement at our feet and would not let us go until we had perused the very last of them. They were, most of them, natives of Cairo, robust, middle-aged men with dark, intelligent features and a moderate knowledge of English. They were clad alike in the usual garb of the well-to-do Egyptians, a full skirt of dark cloth reaching below the knees, a short open coat or jacket of similar material, and a waistcoat of silk or velvet with rich embroideries in silver and gold. They all wore soft Indian shawls carefully arranged as belt and as turban. Their names did not vary very much. Ahmed and Mohammed, Musa, Moses, and Ibrahim occurring again and again in different combinations. And even their testimonials had a kind of family likeness, setting forth in general terms the owner's honesty, intelligence, and amiable disposition. Now and then we found the signature of a famous traveler or a well-known resident of Cairo, but we had been warned not to trust overmuch to these papers, as the real owner of a valuable certificate is apt to let it out on hire to his less fortunate brethren. Under these circumstances it was difficult for us to keep the names and persons and still more so the special virtues and qualifications of our many candidates distinct from each other. Two or three of them, indeed, stood out in high relief from the general company. One, a tall, powerful man, over six feet high and more than proportionately broad, tried to commend himself by stroking his ample stomach and assuring us that he liked to live well himself and would take care his travelers did the same but he would not come to terms, and only repeated again and again that Englishmen did not care how much they paid, 
as long as their table was well provided. Another applicant was a slim youth, a pupil from the American mission schools. We found, on questioning him, that he had not been to Sinai, that he did not understand the dialect of the Bedouins, and that he had no experience in camel riding. But he answered all our objections by exclaiming, with the fervor of a new David, I am young and inexperienced, but I am a Christian, and I trust in the good Lord who will lead us safely across the desert. We could but assure him that we also relied on the blessing of God, and hoped it would not be averted by a more capable dragoman. At length, after many inquiries and much deliberation, we engaged as our dragoman one Ahmed Abner Rahim, the servant of the Most Merciful. He was a strict Mohammedan, yet we took him chiefly on the warm recommendations of Dr. Watson, the well-known head of the American mission in Cairo. And I may here state, once for all, that he gave general satisfaction throughout the journey and fully justified the good opinion of his patron. Ahmed himself was an ardent admirer of Dr. and Mrs. Watson, and of their lamented predecessor, Dr. Lansing, in whose house he had once been a servant. Through the kindness of Dr. and Mrs. Watson, we were enabled to attend several mission services, both in Arabic and English, and to learn something about their work in the land of Egypt. It lies chiefly among the Copts, the descendants of the ancient inhabitants, who are still Christian in name, though a blue cross tattooed on the forearm is often to them the only witness of Christianity. There are now stations at regular intervals along the Nile up to the cataracts, with Christian schools and meeting houses, and their little Dahabiya, with one of the superintendents on board, is always afloat, visiting the outlying flocks and keeping up their connection with the headquarters in Cairo. But the mission addresses itself also to Mohammedans, and chiefly by appealing to their love and veneration for Allah, it has led many of them into the more excellent way. Ahmed himself showed no signs of becoming a Christian, but I feel sure that his deep-seated piety and his strict sense of duty have been fostered and ennobled by his constant contact with Christianity in its highest form at the home of the American missionaries in Cairo. Having secured a dragoman, our next step was to draw up a formal contract with him to be signed and sealed before the English consul and again in presence of the Greek Archbishop of Sinai, who resides in Cairo. He is, by a very old statute, in one person, the Metropolitan and the Abbot of the Monastery on Sinai, and, in virtue of that office, a kind of liege lord over the Tawara tribe, through whose territory we would have to pass. When the Emperor Justinian endowed the monastery with worldly goods, he also assigned to it as serfs some of the surrounding tribes, and there still exists a nominal subjection, though enforced by no temporal power, according to which the men of the Tawara bring their difficulties with other tribes, their differences among themselves, and even their quarrels with their wives, before the monks on Sinai, and never fail to seek their assistance in times of sickness or scarcity. It was important that Mr. Bensley and Mr. Burkett should be free to devote all their time and energy to literary work, unencumbered by cares for daily bread, and, worse in this case, for daily water. Ahmed had great experience in desert traveling, having accompanied the English army to Tel el Kabir, and provided for the officer's mess on the very day of the battle. And so we decided on paying him one inclusive sum, empowering him to treat in our name with monks and Bedouin, to provide tents and tent furniture, to secure a proper supply of water, and to buy food sufficient not only for the double journey, but also for a month's sojourn on Sinai, as we could not reckon on getting anything in the mountains, beyond, perhaps, a sheep from a passing flock, 
or a few vegetables from the gardens of the convent. Half of the money was handed to him at once. The other half was, in his presence, deposited at the bank, to be drawn by him on completion of his work. He was, moreover, commissioned to give backsheesh in our name, not to all who asked for it, which could have demanded a purse of inordinate length, but to all whose good will it was expedient to secure. And by this latter arrangement we escaped an immense amount of fraud and molestation. As soon as the contract was signed before the consul, our dragoman began his work, he was now freely admitted into the hotel and visited us at all hours of the day. For, though we had left the arrangements of the caravan entirely in his hands, he was anxious to indulge individual tastes and came to consult us on every detail. He also at once constituted himself our guide and accompanied us on donkey back as we drove to the archbishop's palace. Here we were received at the outer gate by a porter in ecclesiastical attire, who handed us at the next entrance to a higher official, and so on from door to door until a great dignitary of the church ushered us into the presence of the Metropolitan himself, who was seated on a kind of throne in the grandest of episcopal robes. But he did not seem personally to feel oppressed by his sanctity, we found a jovial, easy-tempered man, who shook hands with us, treated us to coffee and sweets, and at once ordered his secretary to prepare our letters of introduction to his vice-regent in the convent on Mount Sinai. We conversed with him by interpreter, and my husband tried to draw his attention to a little book which he had brought with him from England, the Gospel of St. Peter, which had only lately been edited from a papyrus found in a tomb near Cairo, and which excited at the time much attention in the West. But his eminence did not care much for new discoveries. Four Gospels are quite enough for me, he said, with a deprecatory wave of the hand. But he nevertheless claimed the neatly bound volume, which had been laid on his table as a present, causing thereby no little inconvenience to Professor Bensley, who found it difficult to procure another copy in Cairo. Before leaving the precincts, we were introduced to a sheik of the Tawara, who, with his camels and his men, was to escort us across the desert, and had been summoned hither from his tents beyond Suez to pledge his faith for our safety. He was a picturesque old man, unkept and unshaven, in the coarsest of garbs, yet with an unspeakable dignity of manner and mien. His outer garment was a kind of inverted sack of dark brown canvas with three openings for the head and the arms, and on his feet he had only rough wooden sandals tied with knotted camel hair string, but a voluminous red and yellow turban seemed to make up for other deficiencies. On the following day, in a quiet street behind the hotel, Ahmed gave us our first lesson in camel riding, or rather in mounting and dismounting, which is the only awkward part of it. My animal was lying quietly enough while I got into the saddle, but then suddenly it rose on its hind legs with its front knees still bent on the ground. I should have been pitched over its head onto the pavement if Ahmed had not held me, and it took several days before I got used to these jerky movements and could keep my seat without assistance when the camel was getting up or lying down again. We also tried another way of locomotion in a covered litter, the usual conveyance of Egyptian ladies before the introduction of closed carriages. This time our parade ground was a sandy track near the tombs of the caliphs, just outside the city walls. Here we sat on the flat tombstones of a now unused Arab cemetery, while the camel drivers were making ready for our trial trip. The litter itself was shaped like the Noah's Ark of our toy shops, and painted in the same brilliant colors of red and green. It was hanging by poles and chains from the pack saddles of two camels, one in front, the other behind it. 
the camels were now being elaborately adorned with strings of shells and beads with little tinkling bells and long woolen tassels we had another engagement that morning and would gladly have dispensed with some of the finery but such was the fashion for camels when bearing a lady's litter and we had to wait patiently until the last shell was adjusted to the owner's satisfaction unfortunately while so much attention was paid to the camels the litter itself had been forgotten the steps were missing and when we had somehow been hoisted up by the men we found inside none of the carpets and cushions that might have made it a comfortable lounging place we had to sit down flat on the rough dusty boards too low to look out and yet half choked by the sand that blew in from all sides through the unshuttered and curtainless windows as moreover the uneven steps of the camels gave us a presentment of seasickness we were glad to get out again our morning's work however had not been quite in vain we had given a welcome spectacle to the idlers of the neighborhood who had collected in considerable numbers squatting with their pipes on the sunny banks by the roadside and watching our proceedings with truly oriental composure meanwhile our dragoman had not only concluded his treaties with sheik and archbishop but had also engaged a cook and two other servants to minister to our well-being in the desert these important additions to our party were introduced to us at ahmed's own house whither we drove one morning by special invitation to make the acquaintance of his wife though allowed by the koran to have three of them he like most respectable egyptians of the middle class had contented himself with one and their union was a happy one to judge from his frequent allusions to his domestic affairs though she had borne him no children he occupied a roomy house on the outskirts of cairo with yards and stables attached the chief part of it seemed devoted to his trade as dragoman the lower floors were full of tents and tent furniture saddles and saddle bags and he showed us with some pride the new blankets and tablecloths which he had bought expressly for our use in one corner a narrow staircase led up to the women's apartment it was well carpeted and furnished with low cushioned couches along the walls to which had been added a few chairs for the benefit of european visitors our gentlemen of course had to retire before Ahmed proceeded to show us his wife. She was indeed a beautiful thing to be shown, rather short and plump, but well-shapen, with a clear complexion and liquid brown eyes, clad in a robe of ruby velvet, and half hidden in a transparent cloud of some soft, white, star-spangled material. Her gait was not graceful, probably encumbered by her draperies, and she made no attempt at conversation, but she was lovely to look at as she sat on the divan by our side smiling at her husband and well pleased with us because we admired the many golden rings and bracelets with which she was adorned coffee was brought before we took leave and went down again to inspect our servants the cook a fragile-looking old man a christian from the lebanon seemed hardly strong enough for such an undertaking yet he bore the fatigue well and proved a better cook than some of us had ever had in our english households his two companions were stout and sturdy one an egyptian waiter from a hotel in cairo the other a nigger boy from the sudan ahmed called him his son and somebody told us afterwards the story of his adoption ahmed had traveled on the upper nile when his gun went off accidentally and grazed the head of a bystander. It was a narrow escape, and Ahmed, full of gratitude to Allah, prayed for a special opportunity of pleasing him in return for his mercies lately vouchsafed to his servant. He had hardly risen from his knees when he saw a little slave ill-treated by his master. He bought the child, declared it free, and brought it up as his own we often found this idea of doing god a service of giving him a pleasure connected with the simple faith of otherwise untaught mohammedans 
a physician from Manchester, an experienced oculist, and his wife were staying at the same hotel with us. They went about among the poor people, and he cured or relieved many cases of ophthalmia, without, of course, expecting any return. The man who attended his donkey on these occasions became warmly attached to him, and expressed his admiration by saying to the lady, Your husband, he very good man, he make God very glad. I do not think any other praise could have sounded sweeter in her ears. We told this simple story to several friends in Cambridge, and Dr. Latham of Trinity Hall, seeing its deeper significance, has handed it down to posterity in his beautiful and suggestive little book on the service of angels. At length, the camels and the stores were ready. They started on their march towards Suez, and we arranged to follow three days later by the railway that now connects Cairo with the canal. This interval of comparative rest was most welcome to us. We returned calls. We made a few additions to our personal outfit, such as blue glasses, cork helmets, and puggarees, to protect ourselves from sunstroke and ophthalmia. We filled a large box with our purchases from the bazaars, with photographs and other little mementos, and dispatched it to England. And we wrote long letters to friends and relatives in different countries, for we did not expect to have any means of communication with the civilized world after entering the desert beyond the Red Sea. On January 29th we left Cairo, and during the next hour we traversed the most fruitful part of Lower Egypt, where three successive harvests ripen from year to year. The fields were all green and golden with maize and lentils, with melons and cucumbers, and the water meadows were full of kine, fat-fleshed and well-favored. It is the Goshen of the Bible, and the names of the stations still reminded our philologians of places mentioned in Genesis and Exodus. Soon after, we plunged into the desert, and we felt how hard it must have been for the Israelites to leave the flesh pots of Egypt. The sand was blown into ridges and hillocks, not unlike the waves of the sea. Only now and then, as we approached or crossed the fresh water canal, did we see small patches of green. This canal was in existence two thousand years before Christ, and it was retraced and restored not long ago, chiefly for the benefit of the workers on the Suez Canal. The stations now presented nothing but a few low huts, but on one of the tall signposts we read in large letters, Arabic and English, the name of Tel el Kabir. It was strange to reflect on the cries of agony and fury, on the slaughter and bloodshed that raged here but a few years ago, now when the moving sands of the desert have effaced every trace of the struggle. However, a handsome monument has been erected at some distance from the station to mark the graves of the British soldiers. At Ismailea we touched the Suez Canal, but a long line of telegraph poles above the low buildings on the wharf was all we could see from our windows. We now turned sharp to the south, saw on our left the shining waters of the bitter lake, and could trace the canal itself by the clumps of trees on its banks, and by the tall masts and smoke wreaths of passing vessels. As soon as our train ran into the lively little station at Suez, Ahmed appeared at the carriage door with his satellites. He took charge of our persons and of our parcels, kept the Bakshish crying crowd at bay, and led us safely to the little inn proudly styled Hôtel de l'Orient, where lodging and dinner had been prepared for us, and we gladly gave ourselves up to his guidance, with a comfortable feeling that, with so competent a protector, we need take no further care what we should eat, nor how we should proceed on the morrow. The inn was kept by a polite little Greek. Its chief rooms opened into a kind of garden square, furnished with rough wooden tables and benches, and lit up at night by a few Chinese lanterns. Here we stayed that evening, busy in revising our saddle-bags and night-sacks. 
they were filled for the greater part with the necessary books, dictionaries, grammars, and Bibles in different languages, early fathers, catalogues of manuscripts, and other learned works. We restricted our wardrobe as much as possible, leaving every superfluous article in charge of the landlord, who insisted on writing an elaborate receipt in modern Greek for everything entrusted to his care. We bethought ourselves rather too late that it might be well to take some light literature, poetry, or fiction as a relief from harder studies in hot and weary hours. The Suez station has no bookstall, and the wisdom of the dragoman found its limit here. But a native, loitering about the inn, caught some of our words. He promised, with many sly winks and nods, to show us just what we wanted, and curiosity compelled us to go with him. In and out, through narrow lanes and tortuous passages, he led us into a dark inner room, and there, from under his mattress, from outer wrappings of blankets and camel rugs, and from inner coverings of silver and tissue paper, he produced a large folio Bible, with gaudy illustrations, perhaps seventy or eighty years old. We could not make out where he got it from. He could not read a word of it, but he admired the pictures. I need not say that we left him in undisturbed possession of his treasure. He was disappointed, poor man, but a little backsheesh makes up for many troubles. Next morning we were astir betimes, going to see our caravan, which had arrived two days before us, and encamped at the foot of a sandy hill just outside the town. Suez itself is not the busy and flourishing place we had imagined it to be from its position at the mouth of the Great Canal. It seems that the local magnates squabbled so much about the price of land and the fees for wharfage that the company transferred office and landing stage to Tufikaya, a village two miles to the south, and even there the traffic is considerably less since the canal was lighted by electricity, so that vessels can enter at all times without waiting for daylight outside. The importance of our camp, on the contrary, far exceeded our expectations. It was full of life, getting ready to move on. Over thirty camels being watered, saddled or loaded, accompanied every process with the same snarling growl. The drivers, one to each camel, had been reinforced for the day by idlers from the town and by visitors from neighboring tribes. Some had lit fires and were roasting coffee in shallow iron vessels, or baking flat, unleavened cakes in the embers. Others, in excited groups, were fighting with shrill voices and violent gestures, not for, but against, the separate loads assigned to their camels. Each driver, in most cases also the owner, cried out that his beast was overburdened, and swore by Allah that he would rather return to his tents than carry the allotted amount. We thought at first such a number of camels and men excessive for conveying seven travelers across the desert, but we altered our opinion on seeing the stores which we had to carry. There were water casks, just filled with sweet water from the Ataka Mountains, chained together two and two, ready to be slung across the pack saddles, curious erections not unlike the rough wooden framework of a high-pitched cottage roof but well adapted to the peculiar shape of the camel's back. There were flour barrels, sacks of charcoal, and a portable cooking stove, large crates full of live turkeys, chickens, and pigeons, over two hundred of them, and special water skins and bags of grain for their maintenance. One huge chest was filled with loaves hot from the baker's oven, another with the cook's stores of beans, lentils, and rice. Five tents with their long poles, folding bedsteads, boards and trestles for tables and chairs, and large rolls of mattresses and blankets formed less weighty but more unwieldy packages. Immense baskets with oranges, dates, and dried apricots were still coming in, while large rope nets 
held no end of smaller boxes and hampers and all the necessary utensils of a wandering household to divide these miscellaneous goods into equal shares seemed a herculean labor but ahmed and our old sheik were up to the occasion and by alternately coaxing threatening and bribing they managed to satisfy the most jealous of drivers meanwhile we were not allowed to be spectators only of this busy scene ahmed wanted us to choose each of us our own camel and the best-looking and lightest stepping animals of the caravan were brought for our inspection there is indeed a special breed of camels trained for riding that are used in the army and wherever speed is required but as we had to keep with our tents we wanted no swifter steeds and took to the common baggage camels and wooden saddles of the bedouin these saddles have two high pommels one at the back the other between the knees of the rider who usually crosses his feet in front of it and rests them on the neck of the camel but so broad is the back and so steady the gait of the animal that it is easy to turn from side to side without dismounting and the tedium of a long journey is much relieved by a frequent change of position ahmed had provided large saddle cushions for us securely fastened to the pommels that made commodious seats especially when complemented by our rugs and overcoats we obediently tried two or three different camels and saddles but as we were quite ignorant of what constituted their good or bad points we gladly assigned our right of selection to ahmed who speedily found for each of us a camel a saddle and a man we had to carry our own personal luggage the driver's blanket or cloak his leathern water bottle and private store of bread and dates besides a sack of beans for the camel in case the scanty herbage of the desert should fail us the men were bound to provide for themselves and their beasts but ahmed knew how to keep them in good spirits by doles of tobacco and other timely additions to their comfort the camels were to start at noon going up two miles along the canal to pass by the bridge there to the other side whilst we sailed across the gulf to rejoin them on the opposite shore one more walk through the picturesque little town one more inquiry at the post office one more good-bye wired to england then we went down to the quay where the sails were already set a small crowd had assembled idlers from three continents in all kinds and stages of dress and of undress and when they pushed us off from the blackened timbers of their little wharf and exchanged guttural farewell greetings with our sailors we felt as if they launched us from the shores of civilization into a fabulous sea end of chapter two Part one of chapter three of our journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter three Across the Desert. The weather was beautiful beyond description, and the north wind drove our boat gently through the blue, transparent waters. She was stoutly built and would have won any race if slow and steady always fulfilled their ancient promise mount ataka near suez a well-known landmark far out at sea stood forth boldly against the brilliant sky and the chalk heights of the tith began to show above the low asiatic shore the entrance to the suez canal marked by buoys on either side is kept clear and deep by careful dredging otherwise this northern extremity of the red sea is very shallow and when the tide is out only small boats can cross in safety but we had wind and water in our favor and sailed southward for several hours thus shortening the ride to ayan musa the wells of moses where we had arranged to camp for the night our sailors reclined in a picturesque 
group near the stern, alternately lit up by flashes of sunshine, or thrown into shade by the flapping of the large brown sail, while a red sash or bright yellow turban added beautiful bits of color to their swarthy faces and bronze-tinted limbs. Ahmed opened for the first time his tin box and large wicker-covered flask, henceforth familiar features of our midday rest. He distributed cold chicken and hard-boiled eggs, bread and cheese and oranges, and filled our tin mugs with water and lemon juice. We had been too much absorbed by the novelty and strangeness of our surroundings to think of eating and drinking, but he knew what we wanted, and never was a meal more enjoyed than this luncheon in the rough sailing boat on the Red Sea. Towards three o'clock, or as we had now to reckon, about the ninth hour, we landed at a little breakwater. The sailors laid our luggage down on the beach and pushed off again to reach Suez before night. The breakwater was under repair. Huge timbers and heavy tools were lying about on the sand, but the workmen had left for the day. The camels were not in sight, and the dragoman went in search of them. The soft splashing of the waves on the lonely shore was the only sound we heard as we sat on our rugs and carpet bags and looked on the desert in front of us. I do not know how long we waited, but the sun neared the horizon. A cold wind came in from the sea, and I confess that old stories of hostile tribes and howling jackals began to arise in my mind. At length Ahmed returned, having met a messenger from the sheik. The caravan had been delayed at the bridge and was still several miles behind us. So we started on foot in the direction of the palm trees of Ayan Musa, whose tops we could discern in the far distance four or five miles inland. This little oasis is the first resting place of all caravans from Suez, here the Israelites must have stopped after their passage through the Red Sea, and for the next nine days we were to follow in their track, for the places where water can be found are few and far between, and traveling here is only possible by taking these same stations on the way, though the footsteps of the camels are soon effaced by wind and sand, they all take by instinct the straightest line from one well to the other, and people meet face to face in the pathless desert, as if they were traveling on a well-known road. The yellow sand under our feet was pleasant to tread on, something like the gravel on a garden walk. The palms grew higher and higher above the rosy horizon, and at dusk we reached the fenced plantation of dates and bananas that still bears the name of the great lawgiver. The little hostelry within consisted of low, open sheds built round three sides of a square, the middle part provided with rough wooden benches for the reception of travelers, the rest serving as warehouses or as a shelter for animals. In times of unusual traffic, belated guests would naturally be relegated to these stables without any unkindness on the part of the host. We found the place empty, but for an officious waiter who brought coffee and lit a large stable lantern that swung from a hook in the ceiling. He was very anxious the ladies should recline on his pillows, which he heaped on the seats on one side of the shed. I am afraid we seemed ungrateful, but we had good reasons to prefer the bare boards at the further end. There we huddled close together and instead of watching eagerly for the first signs of the approaching caravan, we forgot desert and oasis, and were overpowered by sleep. About an hour later we were roused by the wild shouts of the Bedouin and the commanding tone of Ahmed's voice. Wide awake and leaning over the fence at the end of the plantation, we seemed still to be dreaming, so weird and fantastic was the scene we had come out to witness. The full moon had risen, 
and covered the desert with a silver sheen that contrasted strangely with the deep shade under the palm trees and the lurid glare of the campfires. The camels, lying down between their burdens, seemed to leave no room for the tents. The men, bewildered by the lateness of the hour, they seldom travel after sunset, and, quite unused to the ways of civilized life, stared in helpless wonder, or fell over each other in their stretching of ropes and unrolling of carpets. The tent poles rose and fell like masts on a stormy sea. The curtains flapped loose in the night air, and Ahmed threatened and thundered, trying in vain to keep each man to his task. They would squat down in mute contemplation, or rush wildly all together where only one was wanted. But while we still doubted whether food and rest could ever be evolved from this chaos, one high pole was firmly fixed. One white roof gleamed in the moonlight. The sound of a gong called us to dinner, and the waiter, with a stately bow, held the curtain aside and invited us to enter. The floor of the tent was covered with matting, the table with a snow-white cloth, a large bundle of flowers, bright candles, and vases of oranges and pomegranates stood in the middle, together with two clear glass flagons for the water, to convince us of its purity. Though the plates and dishes were of tin, they were neatly enameled in white and pink, and when excellent soup, meat, and pudding were served in due succession, our rough cloaks and traveling caps seemed quite out of place at this well-appointed table. Coffee was brought, the genuine coffee of Arabia, whose delicious aroma is elsewhere unknown. The beans themselves, freshly roasted and coarsely ground, fill about a third of the cup, but the clear liquid above is most refreshing and wholesome. It certainly never interfered with our sleep, though we took it every evening. After dinner, we read the history of the passage through the Red Sea from Exodus 14. And then, though our watches only pointed to nine, we remembered that we were to continue our journey at sunrise next morning, and went out to look for our beds. All was now silent. The camels had been led aside to the fires and were asleep, together with their drivers. Four smaller tents had been pitched for the night and the place between them shone white and clear in the rays of the moon. My husband and I took formal possession of one of the tents. We found two camp bedsteads with a profusion of pillows and blankets, a board and trestles for a washstand, and a little carpet covering the remaining part of the sandy floor. Three large buttons and loops served as lock and key to secure the door of the tent, and soon we were warm asleep after this full day's excitement and fatigue. When we woke again, the dawn was stealing in overhead between the umbrella-shaped roof and the circular wall of our tent, and revealing the bright pattern on its curtains, quaint representations of palm branches and cherubim, in red and yellow on a dark blue ground. A strange grumbling sound, like low thunder, reached us from afar. We knew it later on as the morning salute of our camels. Their peculiar hissing snarl, which seems at first to be the very essence of ill temper and discontent, is much softened by distance. It is the only voice vouchsafed to these animals, and by no means always a sign of anger. They use it when meeting their friends and when calling to their young. Another sound, the clanging of the cook's soup ladle on a copper pan, last night's gong, roused us effectually from our meditations, and ere long we unbuttoned our curtains and looked on the glorious radiance of the opal sky and on the boundless expanse of the desert. The sun was as yet below the horizon, and the sand had none of the dazzling glare that makes it later on trying to the eyes. The desert air in these early hours of the day has an indescribable charm. 
It exhilarates body and mind like new wine. However tired we might get in the noonday heat or after a long evening's ride, every new morning brought us redoubled vigor and found us in jubilant spirits. A second application of the ladle told us breakfast was ready. It was well we had finished our toilet and restrapped our night sack, for the Bedouin were already beginning to strike our tent. They worked with a will today. They had accepted once for all their appointed load as they accept an irrevocable fate, and the business of packing went on in peace, with one single exception. Mr. Harris, who, as above mentioned, had joined us at Suez, brought from England an expensive photographic apparatus with all the latest improvements, packed in a separate box. Not wishing to carry this on his own camel, he now ordered it to be sent on with the baggage. But, though compared with water casks and flour barrels, it looked no bigger than the proverbial fly on the camel's back. Not one of the drivers would submit to the additional weight. We saw our personal property securely fastened to our saddles. Ahmed helped us to mount, and himself led the way, leaving the sheik to follow after striking the last of the tents. But still, as we left the camping ground, that unfortunate box was lying on the sand, surrounded by six or seven black-bearded, rough-fisted men, and the disputes of the previous day seemed to be reviving. Somehow the difficulty was overcome. The box reached the next camp, and created no further disturbance. But it is tragic to relate that this same camera, from a small flaw in its mechanism, proved utterly useless, while my own little Kodak, hanging lightly on my pommel or on my shoulder, worked well, even in unskillful hands, and gave us many pleasant memorials of our expedition. Having now fairly started on our ride across the desert, we had leisure to make the personal acquaintance of our camels and of their masters. My camel, Alan, that is, welcome by name, was the only white one in the caravan, rather old and heavy-limbed, but most sure-footed and steady. I got quite attached to it, and I fondly imagined that it returned my affection. It certainly liked the bits of biscuit and sugar that I hid in my pocket surreptitiously after breakfast. The dragoman, while supplying our table most bountifully, was much averse to our giving away even a crust of bread to a beggar or a bone to a stray dog. I suppose he did not know the extent of our charity and whether it might not involve him in serious difficulties, as he could not replenish his stores by the way. Our camels preferred walking in single file, never varying their long, measured stride, neither from fatigue after three days' drought, nor from eagerness when water was near. They were guided by a rope tied loosely about their neck, and they obeyed their driver's voice in getting up and lying down. But we ourselves, perched high on their backs, had no control over them, though we held the rope for hours together while the men fell behind to chat with their comrades. Now and then, when I found myself left in the rear, or wished to ride by the side of a companion, I managed to accelerate the pace for a moment by tapping my camel's neck with my boot as hard as I could. But it soon relapsed into its own regular tempo of about three miles an hour, the only thing that ever disturbed its placidity and made it swerve round with a violent jerk was the sudden appearance of a round black shadow thrown by my sunshade on the white sand just in front of us. Ibrahim, my man, seemed anxious to excuse his camel's naughtiness and told me that it took the shadow for that of a panther, which animal sometimes lurks on the outskirts of an oasis and has been known once or twice in the memory of man to spring on the neck of a solitary camel. I did not know enough Arabic to argue with him on the reasoning powers of the animal's brain, 
but I was careful in future, when opening my parasol, to avoid a similar annoyance. This Ibrahim, who, like the other drivers, made the whole journey on foot, was a well-grown, stalwart young fellow. I could not help admiring the beautiful poise of his head as he marched in front of me, with steps as firm and regular as those of the camel itself. He was clad in a loose shirt and the usual inverted sack of coarse indigo blue canvas, probably woven and dyed by the women of the tent, who had ornamented it in this case with a simple embroidery in red wool along the seams. He had several colored handkerchiefs twisted round his head and wore a long sheathed knife in his belt, together with pipe and tobacco pouch. On the sands he walked barefoot, but when we came to stony ground a pair of rough wooden sandals was produced from one of the saddlebags. In the same recess he kept several blankets or wrappers, which he threw over his head and shoulders one after the other as the day closed in. For, warm as the weather felt to our northern senses, it was the winter season of the desert, and cold enough for the natives. Nearly the whole of our escort were armed with long, rusty guns, swords, daggers, or pistols, but their weapons mostly reposed on the backs of the camels within reach of the riders. These Bedouin get part of their living by conducting travelers and merchandise across the desert between Suez and Petra. Many of them also possess date plantations in the oases or on the seaboard, and their camels and lean black goats provide them with milk and cheese, with fuel and clothing. My Ibrahim's home was in a moving camp, not far from Ayan Musa, and he left us for two days to visit his family, entrusting the care of camel and rider to one of the camp followers, who are never wanting on such an occasion. Most of the men were inveterate smokers, but they preferred to their time-honored pipes the modern cigarettes of Cairo, and it was well for the general goodwill of the company that we had brought a large boxful for their special benefit. Our route lay to the south, crossing a wide headland that jutted for miles into the sea on our right. The sandy desert stretched all around without a sign of vegetation except when we came to one of the shallow watercourses that carry, from time to time, the storm water from the mountains down to the sea. They were quite dry now, and only marked by tufts of rough brown grass springing here and there from the barren soil, which our camels chewed with evident delight. It was difficult to believe that after the rare but furious rainfalls higher up, a stream rushes along here strong enough to overwhelm the camel and its rider. But caravans are warned against pitching their tents in these hollows, as whole camps have been swept away by the sudden whirl of waters that subsided again before the morning. This being my first long ride, I found the constant swaying to and fro very trying, and I called several halts, to have my cushions moved, my straps tightened, or my stirrup adjusted. But these alterations caused a serious delay to the whole party. Ahmed, in each case, had to be summoned from the front, and my camel took so much time bending and unbending its long limbs that I resolved to bear henceforth my discomfort in silence. However, I soon became used to this novel exercise, I learnt to dispose my rugs and pillows to the best advantage, and after a few days camel riding seemed an easy and enjoyable pastime. But on this particular morning we were none of us sorry when we stopped for luncheon after a four hours' journey. The animals were left free to seek a mouthful of withered grass, the drivers crouched round a fire of camel dung, and we arranged our saddles and coverlets as couches under the slope of a sand ridge, sheltered our heads as best we might with our umbrellas, and dozed away the hottest hours of the day. 
In the early part of the afternoon, with eyes only half open, we watched the long line of our baggage train filing past. It had started several hours later, but was now going ahead to prepare a place for us in the wadi, valley, or watercourse of Sadr. When Ahmed called his party together to resume the ride, the shadows of the camels were beginning to lengthen, and the colors of earth and sky to soften and melt into a golden haze on the far-off horizon. There was no trace of life in the desert except here and there, half buried in the sand, the snow-white skeleton of a camel that had fallen by the way. We plodded on patiently for ten miles more, until we saw our tents bathed in the last rays of the setting sun, with the dusky figures of the Arabs hovering in front, tightening the tent pegs and leveling the sand. The cook met us with cups of fragrant coffee, and soon we were secluded within our curtains, removing dust and travel stains, and dressing for dinner. We knew that the water in our jugs must suffice for next morning's ablution, so we used it with care, and as the nights were cold at this time of the year, even in the desert, we put on our warmest cloaks and caps in preparation for the welcome sound of the gong. The crowing of our cocks woke us very early next day, and we too were ready to start before the camels had been saddled. The balmy freshness of the morning sky and the firm and even surface of the ground tempted us to walk ahead by ourselves in the direction pointed out to us by one of the Bedouin, while Ahmed was still engaged in the camp. The desert, as it stretches away into the distance, looks perfectly flat, and the hills on the farthest horizon stand out sharp and clear, appearing to English eyes much nearer than they are in reality. It seemed impossible that camels or men could escape from sight in so open or level a plain, and we wandered leisurely along without dreaming of difficulty or danger. But the occasional ridges and hillocks of sand, shaped anew by every change of wind, and lost to a general survey in their uniformity of whiteness and glare, are yet high enough to hide a man from man, within a hundred yards of each other. We had not left the tents for more than ten minutes when we turned to look for our companions. We saw nothing but sand. We called and got no answer. We would gladly have retraced our steps, but our feet had left no marks on the gravelly soil, and we had not experience enough to be guided by the sun. Turning round and round in the vain hope of discovering some trace of camels or tents, we got quite bewildered as to the direction in which we had come, and we felt like naughty children that have run away from their nurse and do not know where to find her. We had not gone far, and must be missed before long, so there was no serious cause for alarm but we spent a disagreeable quarter of an hour standing in the same place for fear of straying further away and trying to attract attention by waving our handkerchiefs and shouting at intervals. The man who came in search of us looked formidable enough with his long rusty gun and glittering dagger, with his wild gesticulations and unintelligible cries. To us, he was as the angel of Hagar. We soon rejoined our caravan that had meanwhile started from the camp in a different direction, listened meekly to a lecture from the dragoman, and vowed not to go out of his sight for the future. He spoke to us in somewhat broken English, but he perfectly understood all we said to him, and had, moreover, to act as general interpreter, as our servants, the sheik, and the drivers spoke nothing but their native tongue, in most cases a primitive unwritten dialect of Arabic, peculiar to this part of the desert, of which our learned gentlemen understood little more than their wives. But being all eager to learn, we soon picked up the most necessary words, 
and could ask for all we wanted. However, Mrs. Burkett, who had spent part of her childhood in Beirut, was the only one among us who could really converse with the Bedouin. She got much amusing and interesting information from them, and became a general favorite. They called her Emira, a princess. My husband, the oldest and tallest of the party, was distinguished as Effendi, my lord. The rest of us passed simply as ladies and merchants, Hawaji, the usual term for foreign travelers in Egypt. Our efforts at learning Arabic from the camel men, with all their amusing mistakes and misunderstandings, proverbs, riddles, and songs, with now and then a grave philological discussion, seemed to shorten the long morning's ride that brought us to Amara, the place of bitter waters, Exodus 15:23. But as it had not rained for many months, the hollows were dry, and the men clamored to press on towards Gerundel, the ancient Elam, which they hoped to reach on the morrow. So, as soon as the intense heat subsided a little, we mounted again, still riding southward with distant glimpses of the dark blue sea and even of the African mountains beyond. The shadows lengthened, the sun went down in a glory of purple and gold, and the moon rose above the white range of the Tih on our left, and still we went on. We had all dismounted and enjoyed a walk in the delightful cool of the evening, but we did not know how far our vanguard might have pushed on in their desire for water, and it was weary work in the end to pass from one sand hill to another, straining our eyes to discover the tents in the gloaming. Suddenly a bright star seemed to rise just in front of us, and a shout went up from our Arabs, The fire! The fire! We were indeed close upon the camp. Coffee was ready, and dinner in full preparation. Our drinking water was not improved by three days' journey under a burning sun, and we were glad tonight to pass it through a filter and mix it with claret, of which we had fortunately brought a comfortable supply on the advice of medical men. The water of the desert is neither palatable nor wholesome for people unaccustomed to the climate. The Bedouin indeed drink nothing else, though their imperfectly tanned water skins give it at times a most unpleasant flavor. Mohammed forbid his followers all alcoholic liquors, and as a rule, his precepts are kept to this day. There are, of course, exceptions, especially in Egypt, where the population is so largely mixed with foreign elements. But drunkenness as a national vice is unknown. And it was painful to hear a donkey boy exclaim at a drunken soldier or sailor, He a Christian, he drink. The missionaries do all they can to make their converts sober and temperate, in the highest sense of the words, but they regret sometimes that they cannot make total abstinence also a tenet of Christianity. Hitherto we had met only a solitary Arab, whose camel carried charcoal from oasis to oasis, and a couple of half-naked children from a moving tent had scampered along with the camels, happy to get a few raisins or sweets for their trouble. But on approaching Gurundal, we espied a company of camels and men moving in our direction. They were yet a long way off when Mr. Burkett, with sharp-sighted eyes, recognized the ruddy faces and trousered legs of European travelers. The English consul and the chaplain of Suez were returning from a holiday tour to Sinai, and soon we shook hands with them and exchanged eagerly our messages and news. Sitting down on the sand, we scribbled hasty lines to friends in Cairo and Cambridge, while they charged us with greetings to the monks of St. Catherine. We had a fortnight's political news to impart, while they gave us an account of their journey. They had found the top of the mountain covered with snow, and suffered so much from cold in their tents that they gladly accepted the rough hospitality of the convent walls. 
but as the weather had changed on the day when they left, we might hope for more favorable circumstances. Our fame had gone before us. The monks had not only heard of our intended visit, they also knew our successive camping grounds and the probable day of our arrival, and had even pointed out correctly to these travelers the very place where they would fall in with us. We only understood after several weeks at the convent the rapid and regular way in which the inmates receive all similar information. The incessant moving to and fro of families and tribes, their constant connection with the convent, and the clear view obtained from the mountain tops over the greater part of the peninsula, combined to make news travel fast in this country without roads, postmen, and telegraph wires. End of part one of chapter three. Part two of chapter three of Our Journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Part two of chapter three Across the Desert. With many good wishes on both sides, we parted reluctantly from our countrymen, and soon came to look in a wide basin between sandstone hills for the twelve wells of water and the threescore and ten palm trees of Elam. We lunched in the shade of a magnificent doom palm, which, different from the date palm with its long graceful leaves waving from the top of a slender stem, branches out from the roots and forms a compact mass of dark green fan-shaped leaves, looking from afar like one of our large forest trees. The other palms, though their number exceeded that mentioned in Exodus, were mostly stunted, or still in their infancy, and many of the wells were dried up. We saw only one deep hole full of muddy water, not far from our palm tree, it was surrounded by a low wall and troughs of roughly hewn stone, and here the men were soon busy with ropes and pails, drawing water for their camels. It was slow work, and no Rebecca came to assist them. The animals drank deliberately, two or three at a time, in long, thirsty draughts, but apparently without hurry or greediness. There was enough for all, but the day was far spent when the caravan set off once more. We followed about an hour later, and felt like coming home when, after a short and pleasant ride, we found, in a sheltered hollow, our tents pitched, our fires burning, and our table spread with all that hungry travelers could desire. The turkeys strutted about, and the poultry crowed and cackled, glad to be released for a while from their narrow cages. I am afraid they had much to suffer during these first days of their journey, but as chicken, boiled, roasted, or made into soup, formed now the chief article of our diet, the survivors became day by day more comfortably housed. Not having progressed far this day, we started all the earlier on the following morning, we had now crossed the open desert. We left the wilderness of the Tih to the east and entered the sandstone region that forms a stepping stone to the higher granite peaks of Horeb. The ridges of the previous day rose to overhanging cliffs. We rode now through narrow defiles, now through open valleys in ever-varying scenery. Steep hillsides where the different strata showed like bright-colored ribbons, castle-shaped rocks that seemed to bar our way, and distant mountain tops that beckoned us onward. A large heap of loose stones right in the middle of our track was greeted by the Arabs with loud execrations. Each man threw an additional stone onto the mound and wanted us to do the same. It is said to be the grave of a beautiful horse spurred to death by its master, Abu Zenib, here it gave one last frantic leap and fell down to die many centuries ago. But still, 
passers-by remember the gallant steed and curse its cruel rider. The broad valley, Shebeka, led us once more towards the sea. We hoped to hold our siesta lulled by the music of the waves, and to get into the heart of the mountains before nightfall, but we came to a premature stop. Mr. Harris, a good pedestrian and an experienced traveler, was fond of lingering behind or walking ahead by himself, keeping out of sight longer than the dragoman liked. He had been warned to be careful, and had hitherto always rejoined us in good time without causing any anxiety. But today he had left us soon after sunrise. Several hours had passed. The country became more and more broken. We looked out for him from every available vantage ground. We shouted until we were hoarse but only the echo answered with mocking distinctness. Ahmed, who had crossed the desert many times, knew only too well its perils for the solitary traveler. He was without water. No tribe was likely to camp here for miles around, as an exceptionally dry season had driven them all further to the south, and once off the chief track he would not meet any other traveler. At eleven o'clock a general halt was called. We sat down under a group of palms in a sheltered corner of the valley. Ahmed provided us with food and drink. Then he and the drivers went off in different directions to make a regular search. I shall always remember as a nightmare those hours of waiting and the dreadful pictures conjured up by our fears. A funeral in the desert or a skeleton blanched by the tropical sun like those of the poor camels we had seen the day before and the agonizing letter to be written to his home one man after the other returned without having found any trace of the missing traveler a messenger was now dispatched to the sheik who was still some way in the rear and all his men were ordered to scour the neighboring hills find him we shall said ahmed but shall we find him in time we were on the verge of despair when the last of our men came back with mr harris by his side he was not nearly so much exhausted as we had imagined and did not seem to have wandered very far we were all delighted to see him safe and sound and by the afternoon we had all of us sufficiently recovered from anxiety and exertion to continue our journey from this valley of Shebeka, two roads, or rather camel tracks, branch off to meet again near the top of Mount Sinai. One, turning to the left, or inland, reaches it from the north. The other, easier to ascend, and probably chosen by the children of Israel, leads first along the sea, and then up on the western side of the mountain. The three days where we found no water exodus fifteen twenty two were now lying behind us we had carried besides our water casks a quantity of seltzer but would hardly need this on the mountain while we might find it useful when recrossing the plain and as additional weight is always best avoided on a long journey we made a hole in the sand near the junction of the valleys at a prominent angle of the cliffs under a certain juniper bush, and buried our bottles in the hope of finding them again in the still thirstier weather of March. This done, we struck into the long Wadi Tayiba, the happy valley, and made straight for the shore. The air quivered with heat, and the south wind felt like the breath of a furnace. But the sight of the dark blue sea, though yet miles ahead, seemed to cool the atmosphere around us. We rode down along the slope of the Tayiba mountain, perforated by caves and sulfurous springs, and cleft into fantastical shapes. The waves wash its foot, but the tide was out and we could pass between the rocks and the sea, while the camels, who prefer dry ground, found a path higher up on the face of the cliff. We cooled hands and faces in the transparent pools, fishing for strange shells and bits of white coral. 
the briny scent of the wet sands and the spray of the breakers were unspeakably refreshing after our hot ride the african mountains showed in graceful outlines on the opposite shore undimmed by a distance of over fifty miles and a large steamer from india left long silver furrows in the tranquil sea as we rounded the promontory a wide plain opened before our eyes stretching far inland between two ranges of sandstone hills and beyond and above we saw for the first time distinctly the goal of our pilgrimage the dark granite masses of the synactic group the top of the holy mountain itself is not often seen from afar as it is surrounded by other summits of similar size but mount serbal its rival in height and in holiness lifts its proud serrated head in majestic grandeur above its lower companions and formed henceforth a chief figure of our landscape we all regretted that the camels with the tents had already gone up to camp in the valley so that we could not spend the night on the beach the sea never seemed more beautiful no scientific reason has ever been given why it here bears the surname of red but to-day as its quiet mirror reflected the splendor of the setting sun it glowed indeed like red wine and gained a royal right to its title reluctantly we turned from the shore and slowly ascending rejoined our caravan we camped on open ground still in the sight of the sea but when the next morning rose above serbal we set our faces towards the sunny mountain tops at the head of the valley and began in good earnest our uphill work the day became very hot and it was well that we carried water flasks and lemon drops in our saddle bags the latter were an unknown luxury to the arabs and the smiles on their dark faces as they sucked those tiny sweets were pleasant to behold the ground became rough and stony but the camels never slackened their pace and when the shadow of a great rock in the wilderness invited us to our midday rest we had left the hills far below us that stood last night above our tents as we rode on after luncheon the valley narrowed into a mountain pass leading now between high rocks and now along the side of a cliff that descended unpleasantly steep on our left the dragoman ordered every driver to keep close to his camel's head and assured us that we were perfectly safe yet we did not feel comfortable on our high seats jolted from side to side by the uneven steps of the animals when striding over a big boulder or turning a sharp corner of the cliff we all desired to dismount but it was not easy to find places wide and smooth enough for the camels to lie down and it took some time before we were all securely deposited on our feet half an hour's climb brought us to the top of the pass and we looked back into the deep valley from which we had come and far away over vast ranges of sandstone now and then they sloped gently down in even layers forming bands of exquisite coloring in different gradations of russet slate blue and yellowish brown along the steep banks of valley or ravine in other places they have been broken through and tossed about in gigantic disorder by the fiery action of volcanic masses that now rise high above them as dark cones of red or black granite it was a grand sight and taught us more of the power that bringeth forth the mountains than many printed pages of geology but it lacked the winning beauty of our alpine scenery there was neither wood nor water neither green pasture nor soft covering of snow all was bare and dry a few tufts of bedheran a kind of fragrant heather had sprung from the clefts of the rock during last year's rain now they were brown and withered yet they retained something of their pungent flavor and even to this day from among the leaves of my notebook the little dry twigs greet me with the scent of the desert 
A slight descent on the other side brought us into the valley of Budra, a mountain plain strewn with huge boulders of granite, the relics of some ancient flood. A low rampart of light-colored sandstone forms a kind of skirting to the darker heights on either side. It looks almost like the handiwork of giants, and on its stones, where they offer a flat surface easily accessible to passer-by, are found some of the so-called synactic inscriptions. They were formerly believed by certain scholars to be relics of the ancient Israelites, and were expected to confirm, even to supplement, the history of their wanderings. They have now been proved to belong to a much later time. The learned Professor Eutin of Strasbourg, who studied here for several weeks, has transcribed and translated most of them, showing them to be of anti-Muhammadan, probably heathen origin, the work of traders who were in the habit of halting here on their way from South Arabia. The inscriptions seem to date from the first six centuries of our Christian era, and contain chiefly proper names accompanied by short forms of blessings and the like. They occur at longer or shorter intervals over a distance of several miles, until the malleable sandstone recedes before the masterful granite. Low, cone-shaped hills separate Wadi Budra from Wadi Mokatab, the written valley, which is of similar formation and interest. Here we arrange to spend the following day, Sunday, February 5th, a welcome rest for man and beast. So our camp was pitched with more than ordinary care, the five tents, with their far-stretching ropes, formed a circle at the foot of a sheltering hill. The Union Jack was hoisted above the dining tent, and a strong pole in front of it bore a grand Chinese lantern. The rest of the caravan retired to a respectful distance, where the voices of camels and men would not disturb us, while yet the light of their ever-burning fires cheered the darkness of the desert. We had easily conformed to the dragoman's camp rules. We had risen every morning at half-past six, breakfasted at seven, and lain down to sleep at noon. We had mounted and dismounted like good cavalry soldiers at the first blast of the trumpet, and had become fond of our camels and of our saddles. Yet it was very sweet that Sunday morning to disregard the clanging of the saucepan, to turn in bed for another snooze, to dress leisurely without fear that an overzealous Arab might suddenly begin to strike our tent, to be late for breakfast and still to sit down among the first. A flock of black goats came down from the neighboring heights. The herdsman had seen our caravan from afar and was glad to exchange new milk for coffee and tobacco. With rugs and cushions we made comfortable seats outside the tents, shaded and fanned by the lazily flapping curtains. We had English prayers to read, Arabic prayers to learn, and prayers without any words to offer for our prosperous journey. Luncheon this day was a regular meal, daintily dished, and as a pleasant surprise, Ahmed summoned us to afternoon tea. This was not in the bond, but, knowing the weakness of English hearts, he had kindly substituted it for the cup of coffee which the law awarded us on traveling days when we reached the tents in the evening. After tea, we sauntered along the valley and made afternoon calls by visiting our servants and our camel drivers in their private domain. The cook, with great pride, led us to his kitchen and exhibited his bright copper pans fitting into each other with movable handles, and his ingenious oven, of course of English manufacture, that turned out three meals a day for twelve hungry people, and yet could be telescoped and screwed into the smallest possible compass. We were more interested in his tiny charcoal pans sunk in the sand that kept a big kettle boiling for hours together and in his delicate machinery for roasting, grinding, and boiling our beloved coffee, though we soon discovered that our Bedouin accomplished the same good result by feeding their fire with camel dung 
and by grinding their beans between two unhewn stones. Here we were by no means the only visitors. We found that the news of our advent in Wadi Mokatab had spread rapidly through this district of the Tawara tribes. Brothers and cousins of different degrees arrived to meet their relatives, whose blazing fires and full coffee pots showed that the guests were not unexpected. Many of them had walked long distances, twenty or thirty miles during the night. The friends saluted each other by laying hand in hand and temple to temple in a grave, affectionate manner. Then followed the usual formulated questions as to each other's health and that of the family in the tent. The stranger sat himself down on a mat near the fire, and pipes, coffee, and storytelling went round as before his arrival. By far the oldest and most venerable member of the whole company was our sheik, though in his personal appearance perhaps the most neglected of all. He excelled in playing a kind of draughts over which he seemed to spend the chief part of his time, beating all his less practiced opponents. The squares were easily drawn on the sand, and the men consisted of white bits of quartz that abound in the desert, and of peculiar stones, black, hard, and shiny, so we thought, but they were indeed little pieces of dry camel dung. Our drivers varied very much in age, from gray-bearded men down to mere striplings, and one was quite a child, only twelve years old, and not taller than a well-grown English lad of ten. He was the only son of a sheik, and since his father's death, nominal head of the family. He lived in the old tent with his mother, but accompanied the men of his tribe on their journeys, walking across the desert at the rate of twenty miles a day. Mrs. Burkett rode on his camel. She understood his language. He could talk to her of his mother and sister, and her kind words soon gained the little fellow's heart. I have seen him kiss her boot in dumb veneration. It was the only part of her dress he could reach with his lips as she sat in the saddle. He was a brave, winsome boy, still laughing and singing when others grew languid and weary towards the end of the day. I believe his whole wardrobe consisted of a longish blouse or shirt that had once been white, and of a little cotton skull-cap. But he marched proudly along, and looked with the utmost disdain on some little beggars that clamored for bakshish, for was not he the son of a sheik, and the possessor of a camel? The rough men were kind to him, let him lie close to their fire at night, and covered him up with their blankets. We were all inclined to pet him, to let him ride on our camels, or to feed him with dainties. But Ahmed warned us to be careful, lest we should awaken the envy and jealousy, the evil eye of his companions. Poor little Ayid. After exhibiting our scanty phrases of polite Arabic to the men, we went on to the camels. Their forelegs had been chained together, that they should not disperse too far during this long day of freedom, and it was ludicrous to see the short, tripping steps of the usually so far striding animals. Slowly they approached from all sides of the valley, for it was supper time and their cloth was laid. On separate pieces of sacking or canvas, their rations of beans were measured out. Each camel indeed knew its master's crib, or rather its master's discarded cloak. Without sniffing or stooping, they passed by many a tempting little heap, until in their own appointed place they folded their long legs for the night and began to munch with deliberate enjoyment. We watched each of us our own camel, and would have liked to add a pail of water to its dry provender, but though this was the third day since Garundal, we saw no sign of distress. Our own dinner was a sumptuous affair, excellent pea soup, our cook was great in soups, roast turkey and pigeon pie, with sundry sauces and compotes, plum pudding, tarts and jellies, and a profusion of fruit for dessert. Very different from the orthodox cold meat 
dinner of our Sundays at home. But here, with our troop of Mohammedan servants, we had no compunction on that point, and did full honor to the feast. Before saying good night, we read the seventeenth chapter of Exodus, in preparation for next day's ride along Wadi Ferran, which has been identified with more certainty than almost any other place in the peninsula, as the ancient Rephidim. The wind changed during the night. It now blew fresh from the north, and as we started, while the shadows of the hills were still lying across the plain, we tightened our cloaks and walked at a good pace by the side of the camels to keep ourselves warm. But soon the sun proved conqueror, and the day became quite hot enough for our comfort. This valley of Ferran is over fourteen miles long, and stretches, roughly speaking, from west to east, rising slowly but almost constantly towards the center of the peninsula. Mount Serbal, dark and majestic, looks down upon it from the south, and endows the lower part with its own character of barren solitude. Its far-reaching outworks of steep rock, gigantic boulder, and broken cliff make the approach to it more difficult than the ascent, but this also must not be attempted without the assistance of some neighboring Bedouin, for though it stands only 8,000 feet above the sea, much the same as Mount Sinai, its granite walls and deep clefts are dangerous obstacles for anyone unacquainted with the locality. Very different from this stony wilderness is the large, fruitful oasis of Ferran that occupies the upper part of the valley. Here the mountain waters descend as into a basin, fructify the soil, and then escape as a sparkling rivulet that a few miles lower down is lost again in the sand. The running water, the graceful date palms, flowering orchards, and fenced gardens were quite a novel sight after our seven days of desert life. Early church history mentions bishops and even an archbishop of Ferran, and the crosses cut in the rocks above still mark the places where ancient hermits dwelt while the ruins of chapels, towers, and fortifications on the surrounding heights show that the oasis was once the seat of a thriving population. At present, the sparse inhabitants live in tents, in huts rudely built of unhewn stones, or between ruined walls thatched over with palm branches. We saw great flights of pigeons, herds of sheep and goats, and droves of camels with their foals, beautiful little creatures with the mysterious charm that belongs to all things young, even when humpbacked. Children, half or entirely naked, ran in and out of the banana groves, or peeped at us furtively from behind hedges of prickly pear, and a few men came to salute their cousins in our caravan. Otherwise, the rich plantations seemed to be deserted by their owners." Several tribes have their encampments here, but their nomadic instinct will not allow these people to settle quietly in any given place, however fertile and pleasant. The men prefer the freedom of the desert. They carry the products and simple manufactures of their oasis far away into Egypt and Palestine, and only return at stated seasons to gather in their crops or to rest a while from their travels. The celebrated dates of Ferran are here crushed and compounded into a firm dough, mixed with almonds, and sewn tightly up in pieces of skin in the shape of short, thin sausages. Thus prepared, they keep for years, are most nutritious and of excellent flavor. Cut into slices, they look like the well-known servilot worst of Brunswick, and were easily mistaken for such by friends who saw them at our house in Cambridge. Another product of Ferran is Kamar ed Din, in English, the moon of religion. This is a kind of apricot marmalade, boiled a long time, then spread and dried in thin layers on flat, hot stones. It looks and feels like coarse brown blotting paper, and is of all kinds of food, the most portable. Like paper, 
it can be folded up or torn into pieces and carried in pocket or turban but in the mouth it melts like jelly is meat and drink in one and with its pleasant slightly acid taste very refreshing in hot weather it is a great boon to the natives during the severe fasts of ramadan being readily at hand whenever the setting sun or the muezzin gives the sign of reprieve thence its otherwise incomprehensible name mats and fans of palm leaves are made here in great variety and number chiefly by the women and children also a special sort of saddle-bag a rough camel-hair cloth with bright embroideries in red and green wool and long tassels of the same material most of our camels were furnished with these saddle-bags and the tassels that almost touched the ground made agreeable handles for us when walking by the side and helped us to keep up with the long stride of the animals this is easy enough for a moderate walker but if you once allow yourself to fall behind only for a minute you cannot recover your place without a smart run which is not convenient under an almost tropical sun most travelers stop a few days in ferran to examine its ancient ruins and to make the ascent of serbal but the nearer we got to mount sinai the more intent we became on the work that awaited us there we passed at dusk through the most interesting part of the valley and encamped a little higher up on a sandy flat it seems natural that the amalekites should have collected their forces in this neighborhood when bent on resisting the inroad of foreign tribes here they guarded the pass to the holy mountain and here they held the water whilst the host of israel toiled up the long valley murmuring against moses our guides had pointed out to us in the morning the rock that Moses struck, and later on that other rock where Aaron and Hur upheld his hands. It was not surprising to students of the Koran, but very pleasing to see the veneration of these Arabs for Abraham and Moses, and for all the places connected with their history. Mount Sinai is sacred to them as to us, and the Christian monastery in the shadow of that holiness rests secure from any molestation hitherto we had always pitched in the open desert miles away from any human habitation tonight we had neighbors and they did not allow us to forget them my pillow touched the outer curtain of the tent and at midnight i was startled by the sharp cry of a fowl close to my ear it was repeated feebler in the distance and I concluded that a jackal was making off with one of our hens. But a loud turmoil arose of angry shouts and hurrying feet, of pistol shots and hoarse cries of harame, harame, i.e. robbers. However, we had not much time to be alarmed. Ahmed's reassuring voice called on us to keep quietly in bed, and ere long everything was silent as before. We had almost forgotten the disturbance of the night when at breakfast time we found two young ruffians tied to the lantern post in front of the tents. They were dressed or rather draped in the dirtiest of blankets and their scowling faces and long black hair gave them a forbidding appearance. But though captured and kept for our inspection they had not been ill-treated nay even provided with hot coffee and tobacco these were only two out of a band of five or six that had made a successful attack on our poultry on our loaves and oranges but there was no redress to be had and by taking the law into our own hands we should only make matters worse by bringing on our defenseless heads the revengeful anger of a whole tribe yet to show these miscreants that english travellers cannot be molested without some inconvenience ahmed sent for their sheik an old man with a most shrewd and wily expression on his wrinkled countenance and we were all drawn up as in solemn conclave looking as serious and wise as possible though at the time we understood little or nothing of the proceedings 
Ahmed began by explaining to the sheik that we were bound on a visit to his liege lord, the holy abbot of Sinai, who would look upon our affliction and replenish our woefully diminished stores, but would also warn all future travelers against employing the men or the camels of so treacherous a tribe. The sheik then pleaded with many salams that the culprits did not belong to his clan, but unfortunately for him, the prisoners had already claimed him as their uncle and protector. He next pleaded that nothing had been taken away, and that the whole affair was a vain alarm caused by some boys who had lost their way among our tents. But as Ahmed stood firm, and our solemn features did not relax, he came down step by step and ended by promising full restitution of our goods and dire punishment of the offenders, if only we would obtain for him a full pardon from the abbot. And so we parted with many mutual compliments and vows of everlasting friendship, and went our ways, he arm in arm with his worthy nephews, rather proud of having attracted so much attention, and we, poorer by a few loaves, but richer in memory by a most dramatic scene of life among the Bedouin. As this sheik felt himself answerable for the misdeeds of his people, so our sheik had pledged his faith for the truth and honesty of his followers, and we had learned by this time that we could trust them implicitly. We had no doors to lock, no boxes to shut. We slept soundly all night. Our saddlebags were often left outside the tents, and all stores were at the mercy of the drivers. Yet not the smallest thing did we lose during two months of this out-of-door life. I broke my comb, and possessing a duplicate, threw away the pieces before leaving the camp. They were brought back to me at night by one of the attendants. Yet with all this loyalty towards us, whom they had taken under their special protection and guardianship, I have no doubt that the same men, under different circumstances, might become dangerous enemies to unwary travelers. Poor Professor Palmer, one of my husband's predecessors at Cambridge, was treacherously murdered in the peninsula in 1882, probably by men of the Tawara tribe. But he was traveling in the interests of the British government on a political mission, and was known to carry a large sum of money on his person. Between two prominent cliffs, as by a wide gate, we left the beautiful valley of Ferran, and came to an open hillside with tufts of Beheran, and of a low leafless shrub with white thorns, three or four inches in length. We had left Serbal a good way behind us, yet its proud, well-known head kept full in view, while the much nearer summit of Sinai was still hidden from our eyes by the rising ground in front. We were now 4,000 feet above the sea, and a keen mountain breeze tempered the heat. We hardly felt the fatigue of this long day's ride, which brought us to the foot of a steep pass called the Pass of the Winds. Here we camped for the last time in company with our camels. As a farewell present for their drivers, Ahmed had bought a sheep at Ferran, and had carried it so far on his camel. It was now handed to the men, and they at once proceeded in childish glee to prepare it for their supper. They seldom taste meat, but live chiefly on bread and dates, and on the milk and cheese from their flocks. The kid from the goats and the fatted calf are regarded as luxuries now, as in the times of Abraham and of the prodigal son, and are only killed for honored guests or on festal occasions. We heard their shouts and their laughter far into the night, and they let nothing of it remain until the morning, save the black fleece, which was to make a new cloak for their sheik, without any help from the tailor's art. Several of the men possessed already such garments, and the forefeet, with the hoofs left on, made convenient strings for fastening it around the neck. Soon after breakfast we began to ascend on foot, 
the last granite ridge that separated us from the holy mountain. The pass was not nearly so difficult as it had looked from below. It seemed to be quite a frequented road for this part of the world, and the camels followed us with ease. We sat resting some time on a block of ancient lava, looking down on a little oasis far, far down below us, like a bright green gem in the roughest of settings. About ten o'clock we emerged on a wide oblong plain, three or four miles in extent, between volcanic hills. It was a barren desert without shade or vegetation. But at its further end, right opposite to where we stood, rose a cone-shaped mass of dark red granite, three thousand feet above the plain, so abruptly that the warning not to touch the mountain seemed easy to understand. Deep rocky valleys on either side separated it from other summits of inferior height. And there, some way up in the valley on the left, we could just discern the dark walls of the monastery, built like an eagle's nest on a narrow ledge of the holy mountain. End of chapter 3「Four of our journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter Four: The Monastery. The early history of the monastery of St. Catherine is difficult to trace. According to old legends and inscriptions, the Emperor Justinian, about 530, built the outer walls, strong walls of granite twenty to thirty feet high, and forming an irregular square some two hundred feet in extent. There are but a few narrow windows or loopholes. Sixty years ago there was not even a door, but visitors and monks alike were hoisted in large baskets to an opening in the upper part of the wall. The place was evidently built as a stronghold to defend the pass leading from the plain of Eraka in the north, where the children of Israel are said to have encamped, across a shoulder of the mountains into the Wadi Tarfa, that slopes gently down to the south. It was first occupied by a garrison of Roman soldiers, sent to protect from savage Saracen tribes the inmates of an earlier monastery dedicated to the Virgin Mary higher up in the mountain, and the pilgrims and anchorites that flocked hither from Egypt and Syria during the early centuries of the Christian era. Though, strangely enough, in the whole course of the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah alone is mentioned as having visited this scene of the earlier dispensation. A grotesque old picture in the archbishop's room represents Mount Sinai as covered by monastic buildings in the shape of medieval castles half as high as the mountain itself. Certain it is that the very inhospitality of these sacred rocks proved attractive to the religious mind. Hundreds of hermits lived and died here, dwelling alone in solitary caves, or gathering in groups at the feet of favorite preachers, in sheltered hollows where the waters are held as in natural cisterns and reservoirs after the heavy rainfalls or snowstorms that occur here at the best two or three times a year, and where the traces of human habitation still survive in rude stepping stones or in a few straggling fruit trees of foreign importation. When the flourishing Christian community in Ferran declined through heresies within and persecutions without, many of its members retired to the secluded wilderness of Sinai, and this became, before the time of Muhammad, the chief seat of Christianity in the peninsula. Yet it was not exempt from persecution. Many were the martyrs under Diocletian and Maximinus. Later on, the untutored Saracens carried on the work of murder and rapine, and the substantial walls of Justinian became a welcome city of refuge. Even the monks of the Virgin descended from their airy, and probably at this time, 
transferred to safer precincts their sight of the burning bush. It is cherished to this day under the roof of the church, but in closer proximity to the well of Jethro than is quite consistent with the biblical narrative. And here the monastery grew and flourished. It counted from 300 to 400 inmates, who, with infinite patience in planting and irrigating, transformed the stony slope of the mountain into terraced gardens and orchards. It was visited by princes and emperors, and endowed with lands and dependents. It had colonies of its own order in Egypt and Russia and in the islands of Greece. Its richly decorated church, though hardly founded by Justinian himself, as some chroniclers assert, was built not many years later, and its abbot received the dignity of archbishop, though nominally subject to the metropolitan of Jerusalem. A new odor of sanctity arose in the ninth century with the legend that the body of St. Catherine, said to have died on the wheel in 312, had been carried by angels to this mountain of Sinai, it is difficult to connect the virgin martyr of Alexandria with the bones which the monks disinterred here so many hundred years later, yet there is the fact that she became the favorite saint of the Eastern Church, and that her supposed remains lie in a beautiful marble sarcophagus in the church of the monastery on Mount Sinai, which has now, for more than a thousand years, borne the name of St. Catherine though the original foundation was dedicated to the Virgin Mary and the church itself built in memory of the transfiguration. The great wave of Mohammedan conquest that swept the ancient lands and made all their inhabitants submit to the sword or the Koran did not interfere with the monks on Sinai. Rendered cautious by the history of former persecutions, they had become wise in their generation and managed somehow to conciliate the powerful prophet and to keep on friendly terms with his successors. Tradition tells us that Muhammad, in early years, when on a pilgrimage to the mountain of Moses, was kindly entertained by the monks, who later on, in memory of such hospitality, obtained from him a formal letter of protection, signed by his own hand with a broad black mark, for Muhammad, in all his wisdom, could neither read nor write. This letter acted as a talisman in keeping off invasion and pillage. Sultan Selim, it is said, carried off this precious document to keep as a curiosity with other ancient relics, but left an authenticated copy with the monks. This also has disappeared, but a second, later copy is still shown at the Greek monastery in Cairo. In modern times, the safety of the monks is guaranteed by a special charter signed anew by every sultan of Constantinople. Baldwin, the short-lived king of Jerusalem, intended to visit the shrine of the burning bush, but was dissuaded by its clever custodians, who feared to provoke the fanaticism of the surrounding Saracen tribes. Such careful policy accounts for the strange presence of a mosque within the convent walls. Some say that its erection was due to the consideration of the monks for their Mohammedan servants, or to their preparations for a visit from Saladin. But, as we find it mentioned already in 812, it was more likely the outcome of some early compromise with the advancing forces of Islam. However that may have been, the monks of St. Catherine remain undisturbed in their mountain fastness. Their numbers have gone down to forty or fifty. Many of their lands have been alienated. But otherwise, the inner constitution and the outward appearance of the monastery are not much different now from what they were one thousand years ago. The same rites have been performed and the same prayers recited, day by day and night by night. Still, the church and the mosque stand peacefully side by side, 
and only their perforated tower and snow-white dome are seen above the high outer walls as we ride slowly across the plain of Iraqa. The holy mountain, a plain bare cone as it first came into view, began soon to show its deep vertical clefts and towering rocks, until it looked, as we drew nearer, like several peaks welded and hammered into one, while now and then a gnarled olive tree or a dark cypress told of hidden springs trickling from the riven granite. Wadi Ed Deer, the valley of the convent, towards which we now wended our way, is a narrow gorge whose sides appear to have been torn asunder by an earthquake. Large masses of rock have fallen down, almost blocking the pass, and balanced one upon the other, as if ready to crush the intruding traveler. On our left we look down a wide valley, wadi as sheik, part of the second caravan route from Gurundal. Compared with the wild scenery in front of us, this seemed quite a hospitable region, the sides less steep, and the flat, sandy bottom relieved by scattered tufts of herbage and by a browsing flock of lean black goats. Like a sentry box at the entrance of the valley stood a solitary hut on a rocky, circular mound, four rough stone walls with shutterless openings for window and door. It was erected as a shelter for Captain Palmer during his survey of Sinai, and long after the storms have swept it away, the name of Palmer's Hill, which the natives have given to the mound, will perpetuate his memory in the desert. Not far from it is a Bedouin burial place, unspeakably dreary and sad, a low wall of loose stones pretending to keep out the jackals, a few flat, irregular tombstones without any attempt at ornamentation or inscription, and as the only sign of loving thought for the dead, a few dry sticks, once palm branches, planted at the head of a little grave in the remotest corner. Another similar wall, but higher and stronger, surrounds about half an acre of ground just at the foot of Wadi Ed Deer, a resting place for caravans that have not, like ourselves, obtained permission to camp within the grounds of the convent. The path up the valley, well trodden by camels and men, resembled now a gravel walk, now a rocky stairway or a deep sandy track. Only once, for about fifty yards, it widened into a well-paved road, probably the remains of a never-finished avenue planned in remote ages in expectation of some distinguished pilgrim to Sinai. At length, our ten days' journey across the desert was accomplished. We had made the last stage of it on foot, and as the valley got a little broader, we came up onto a kind of natural platform just opposite to the walls of the monastery. They looked nearly as old and forbidding as the mighty mountain itself that towered beyond in almost perpendicular cliffs. But at their feet the wilderness blossomed indeed as a rose, almond trees in fullest flower, olives with their tender bluish foliage, and cypresses in darkest green clothed the orchards in a wealth and variety of color that hardly needed the somber background of granite to make a perfect picture for the painter's eye. All the trees of the world grow in the convent garden, thus little Ayid had told us in childish admiration. Certainly all the beauty that trees can give to a barren land was present in this place. Our dragoman was at once admitted by a heavy wooden gate into some outer court. He went to present our credentials to the porter and the steward, while we sat on the rocks outside, waiting, full of awe and curiosity. Between us and the ancient walls was first a rough road, and then a large covered well or cistern, its low stone roof sloped to the ground, and a dark flight of stairs went down as into a vault. Here several men were busy fetching water or performing their ablutions, 
apparently quite unconcerned about the arrival of strangers. But a group of scantily clothed children watched our every movement with beautiful, wondering eyes, not, I am afraid, without a view to future backsheesh. When Ahmed returned, he was accompanied by a monk, who beckoned us to enter. The court was occupied by different sheds or outbuildings. On the right, some stone steps descended into the gardens, while on the left, a low, evidently modern gateway, led into the convent itself. Here we were welcomed by the steward, a handsome, intelligent man, in a few words of fluent French, intimating that the abbot, or more correctly the locum tenens of the abbot archbishop, who resides for the greater part of the year in Cairo, was ready to receive us. We had to stoop in the dark, narrow passage through the massive wall that brought us into one of the inner courts. The ground here was very uneven, for we stood on the slope of the mountain, and rock-hewn steps, worn by the feet of many centuries, led up and down wherever we turned. The buildings themselves, erected in different ages and for different purposes, are most irregular. Strong vaulted rooms built against the outer wall, rough wooden galleries, little upper chambers high on the roof, hidden oratories, and a splendid church. But of all of this, we saw little during that first visit. Our minds were occupied, oppressed, by the traditions of the place. We stood on sacred ground, in one of the oldest strongholds of our faith. The man we were going to meet was a link of the chain, a member of the long line of hermits, preachers, and martyrs, of scribes, abbots, and bishops, who have handed down to our days the light of Christianity in the desert. And he was, in his own person, the highest dignitary of the holy Catholic Church in this wide Mohammedan district. Had the rules of the convent required it, we would willingly have knelt on his threshold or kissed the hem of his garment. But our pious exultation was doomed to some disappointment. A stout, red-faced monk, in the plain black garb of the Greek priesthood, rather greasy in this case, rushed forth with loud shouts of merriment, and fell on the neck of Mrs. Lewis, with whom he had made friends during the previous winter. He patted her affectionately, he felt her garments, he made her sit by his side with his arm around her shoulders. A lively conversation then followed in modern Greek, of which we understood nothing, but frequent bursts of laughter showed it to be of a very pleasant nature. The room was comfortably furnished, though of course without glass to the windows, and several young monks watched this unecclesiastical mode of reception with unmoved faces. We tried to do the same. His excessive friendliness augured well for his readiness in producing his literary treasures. The good old man had to be propitiated, yet we did not relish the thought that we might have to submit in our turn to similar familiarities. However, we were dismissed with a gracious shake of the hand, after partaking of some delicious quenched jam that was served in a beautiful glass bowl with a silver spoon for each guest. We now retired to the gardens, or rather to a long, narrow field planted with olives that had been set apart for our use. It was separated by walled embankments from other terraces and plantations, and at its lower end stood the mortuary chapel of the monks, a plain whitewashed building with a little belfry on the top. Where the trees grew highest, on the side next the convent, was a well of crystal clear water surrounded by the usual low wall and drinking troughs for the cattle. Above it, four stone piers with solid arches of masonry formed a kind of primitive temple, and here we rested during the heat of the day. In the afternoon, the abbot, Hegumenos, invited us to a second interview in order to show us the books. So, at the eighth hour, 2 p.m., we went, as before, to his private room. 
We had waited there some time when we heard hasty steps, a fall, a cry, and the poor man came in with bleeding face and disheveled hair. He had slipped on the stairs and struck his temple against a sharp corner. But though much shaken, he would not hear of dismissing us, but led, with grotesquely bandaged head, the way to his library. It contained on orderly shelves from 800 to 900 mostly printed books, Bibles, homilies, and prayer books in Arabic, Greek, and Latin, works on history and biography, and a few volumes of travels. Perhaps the most important book in the room was a facsimile copy of the great Codex Synacticus, presented by Professor Tischendorf in place of the original manuscript, which he discovered here in some forgotten corner in 1844. He carried it away with him as a loan, and persuaded the monks later on to give it as a precious offering to the head of their church, the emperor at St. Petersburg, where it is now carefully preserved, ranking with the Codex Vaticanus as one of the earliest documents of Christianity. But neither Tischendorf's Codex, nor any of the other manuscripts transcribed or collected here by the learned monks of bygone centuries, were ever kept in this so-called library. At the time of our visit they were huddled together in large chests in a dark, musty closet off the archbishop's room, a large, lofty apartment used as the Metropolitan's Judgment Hall during his annual visits to Sinai, and that sanctuary was not to be opened before the following day. When we returned to the garden, the sun had disappeared behind the mountain, though it was still some hours before sunset. The baggage train had not arrived. A chilly wind crept up the valley, and our corner near the well had become cold and comfortless. We sat close together, trying in vain to keep warm, and our spirits sank very low by a natural reaction after the excitement of the morning. Ahmed tried storytelling. We even began a round game. But nothing availed until the growling of our camels in the yard above suddenly revived us. The men had been well schooled during the march. There were none of the wild scenes like those at Ayan Musa. Each man knew which bale to undo and which rope to fasten. And in a time that seemed incredibly short, even to our weary limbs and impatient stomachs, the tents were pitched and the coffee cups filled. The cook was not long over his preparations for dinner, and the reading of Exodus 19 made a fitting conclusion to this memorable day. Next morning the poor old abbot was not well enough to receive us, and we went instead to take leave of our Bedouin and our camels. They had camped by the well outside and were now returning to their tents and their pastures. They readily agreed to come again in a month from this time to carry us back to Suez. Yet as we watched them going down the narrow valley one by one, the ships of the desert that had brought us to this rocky island, we felt for the moment like stranded sailors without the means of getting home again. Except during stated hours of divine service, the convent gate was open from morning till night, and we found our way under dark archways on different levels from one narrow court into the other. The old well, with its heavy stone roof and large windlass, is pointed out as the place where Moses helped the daughters of Jethro to water their flocks. There are little beds of herbs in sunny corners, and the bare stems of two or three cypresses have grown to an immense height in order to lift their green heads above three-storied buildings and overhanging galleries into the free mountain air. When one of the black-robed monks met us, he bowed his head and passed quietly by with a murmured blessing. But as we descended the wide steps that led from a higher court towards the beautifully carved portal of the church, a verger or sacristan signed us to enter, and presently we were joined by Nicodemus, the steward, 
with whom we could freely converse in French, and who made a capital guide. The church is an early Christian basilica and a good example of Byzantine architecture. The outside is plain and insignificant, hardly distinguishable from the other buildings that hem it in or lean against it. But the interior, richly decorated and in excellent preservation, is in strange contrast with the nakedness of the land and with the moldering cells and primitive habits of the monks. Massive pillars of granite with foliated capitals divide the nave from the low aisles, which are, each of them, lighted by five long, narrow windows, and contain several oratories and chapels dedicated to different saints. Between the columns are old wooden stalls, on the left a kind of pulpit, and on the right the bishop's throne. The carving is somewhat heavy and clumsy, yet not without interest. One of the panels represents a model of the convent, held up by Moses and St. Catherine. Others commemorate ancient bishops and benefactors. The raised platform of the choir comes out some way beyond the wooden screen with its gigantic crucifix, and the altar stands in front of the screen, as it were in the shadow of the cross. The pavement of red and black marble is modern throughout, but from the ceiling hang a hundred antique lamps of silver or beaten brass, all different in size and shape. Some are ornamented with ostrich eggs, others with silver doves joining their wings in a circle and carrying the lights on their heads. Though the church, according to Eastern custom, is overladen with painting and gilding, even the granite columns are painted green, with pictures and hangings and tapestries, yet the effect of the whole is more solemn than gaudy. The upper part of the apse, or choir, is filled with beautiful mosaics of the 7th or 8th century, equal to those in the churches of Italy. The chief space is given to the scene of the transfiguration, while Moses before the burning bush and Elijah, the prophet of Horeb, occupy other prominent places. And St. Catherine, martyred on the wheel, carried by the angels or crowned by the Virgin, occurs again and again in woodwork, painting, and embroidery. Her marble sarcophagus stands in the midst of the choir. A smaller one, entirely of silver, was presented by the Empress Catherine the Great, and there are many other precious offerings in honor of the saint. Four regular services are daily held in the nave, two of them during the night, besides other rites performed before particular shrines. Of these, by far the most holy, the great sanctuary, in fact, of the church on Mount Sinai, is the chapel of the burning bush at the back of the apse. Going down a few steps, we came first into a little lobby, provided with a comfortable armchair and footstool. Here we sat down, one after the other, to take off our shoes. Then Nicodemus unlocked the door and allowed us to enter. The room is about ten feet square, the floor covered with a thick carpet, the walls with old porcelain tiles of a soft blue tint and the panels of the door with mosaics in ivory and gold. In the outer wall, high up, is a square window with dim panes of glass, and beneath it a little altar, rather an open shrine. Three silver lamps, always burning, hang inside, and a plate of solid silver is let into the floor below to mark the site of the burning bush. The cross on the altar of exquisite workmanship is a gift from the Emperor of Russia. Nicodemus took it down and even gave it into our hands that we might examine the delicate details, the artistic figures in the small enameled medallions and the jeweled initials of St. Catherine that are skillfully interwoven into the arabesque tracery. Perhaps in our eyes, the impressive beauty of the chapel was a little marred by the grotesque old pictures chiefly of apostles and martyrs that abound on the walls, but the monks admire it all the more for these pious additions, many of which are, moreover, long-cherished presents from illustrious pilgrims. 
not only this particular place, but everything else in the church is kept with the greatest care, and the good fathers do not allow rust and moth to corrupt their treasures. It is different with the mosque that stands close by. Though substantially built, it looks unused and neglected. The Bedouin that pass with their camels, though allowed to enter, prefer to say their prayers outside, and the flat roof of the well by the roadside seems to be a favorite place, where they spread their little mats and perform their devotions after washing in the water below. At last, on the afternoon of February 9th, the abbot met us in the archbishop's room, and the palimpsest was brought out from its secret hiding place. The photographs taken by Mrs. Lewis were excellent indeed of their kind. The book was much larger in size, and the underwriting, from its yellowish tinge, more easily distinguished from the clear black characters of the later work. But the Gospels looked very faint and forlorn. Their washed-out remains were partly, often entirely, covered by the female martyrology, written ruthlessly across them by the vigorous hand of some devout and, no doubt, well-meaning scribe. And it seemed at first sight as if little more could be recovered from the original than from those photographs. Yet the almost complete edition of the four Gospels in Syriac, transcribed from the Synactic Palimpsest, published by the Cambridge University Press in 1894, has since shown to the world how many difficulties can be overcome by true scholarship, self-devotion, and unremitting labor. The archbishop's room not being always accessible, the precious volume was at once transferred, in the custody of a monk, to an upper chamber, opening from the wooden gallery at the top of the building, and the narrow window not admitting sufficient light, a rickety table was pushed out onto the gallery itself, and here my husband sat down, the first to attempt the deciphering of this almost illegible manuscript. A strong wind was blowing, flustering the leaves and chilling the reader, but he worked quietly on until the monk on duty told us that it was eleven, five p.m. according to our chronology, and therefore time to shut the convent gate for the night. By the kind interference of Mrs. Lewis, whose every request the abbot seemed ready to grant, the book was henceforth entrusted entirely to the care of our party. It was taken down to the gardens and kept in the tents, and the work was considerably lightened by thus putting the time and place of it at the command of the transcribers. End of chapter 4Part 1 of Chapter 5 of Our Journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Part 1 of Chapter 5 Our Life in the Garden. The treasure for whose sake we had come so far was now in our midst, and it naturally became the pivot on which our daily life revolved. The perfect light of that cloudless sky was essential to the work. In the misty atmosphere of England it would have been impossible, and the very best artificial light, we had only two candlesticks between us, would not have sufficed. Professor Bensley, Mr. Burkett, and Mr. Harris divided their nine or ten hours of daylight into three regular watches, and the work of recovering the obliterated text went on without intermission. Quite early in the morning, one of our washstands was raised to the dignity of writing desk. It was put in the garden to catch the first rays of the sun, and the book was taken out of the silken cover in which we enveloped it every night. Mostly my husband undertook the first watch, wrapped in his great coat with comforter and woolen gloves, for the nights were still frosty in February. A kind of hallowed circle was kept around that little table all day, where no interruption was allowed to intrude, 
though loving hands were ever ready to sharpen the pencil or refill the inkstand, to hold down the leaves when the wind was high, or reach Bibles and dictionaries that found no room on the narrow board. Our servants soon felt the importance of the task. Early coffee and extra meals were willingly prepared for the faithful workmen who had to forego the family breakfast or luncheon. The monks, when they passed through our grounds to their lower plantations and gardens, looked wonderingly at these wizards from the north, who paid so much attention to the yellow parchments which their owners could neither read nor appreciate. Now and then one of them stood with bated breath behind the chair, and watched the pen of the ready writer, but neither servant nor monk dared speak to the student on duty any more than on shipboard to the man at the wheel. Meanwhile, the dragoman, the cook, and the waiters had settled comfortably in the corner near the well. They had worked hard for us during the journey, hardest after reaching the tents in the evening, when they too were tired by riding all day. But here Ahmed increased his staff by an elderly Arab who acted as kitchen maid, and by an impish little boy who was supposed to look after the poultry, and they all enjoyed many hours of ideal oriental repose by sitting cross-legged on their mats and smoking their pipes in the sunshine. Our turkeys and chickens also led a pleasurable life in the orchard, where abundance of last year's olives was to be found by scraping in the dry and sunny soil. They fattened visibly, and there was no lack of new-laid eggs for the breakfast table. Our tents, no longer struck every morning, assumed more civilized manners. They stood facing each other with an open space in the midst that was leveled and swept with scrupulous care by the black son of Ahmed. Our clothes and books, instead of being crammed into saddlebags and strewn about the floor, were neatly arranged on hooks around the tent, or piled on rush-bottomed chairs which the monks had kindly added to our scant stock of furniture. The large bread chest, with a red cloth to cover it, made a fine sideboard for the dining room, and our menu was varied by fresh vegetables from the gardens, and by occasional presents from the monks, compressed dates, quince jam, and a delicious kind of date wine manufactured in the convent. At dinner, after sunset, we all reassembled, and the incidents of the day were discussed in lively conversation. Ahmed came in with dessert. A handsome man, in picturesque attire, he never looked better than on those occasions, when he stood at the back of the tent, with the light full on his dark, intelligent features, and began to tell us his wonderful stories. He told of travels by land and sea, of the pilgrimage to Mecca, and the battle of Tel el Kabir, fairy tales like those in the Arabian Nights, amusing anecdotes of priests and pashas, outwitted by simple fellaheen, and weird legends about the evil eye, in whose power the most enlightened Mohammedans seemed firmly to believe. On moonless nights a lantern was lit in the little square to show us the way to our beds, and we retired early to our rest, hearing only seldom, as in a dream, the tinkling of the bell that called the poor monks to their vigils. The palimpsest contained about three hundred pages, of which a third fell to each of the transcribers. Mr. Harris was an indefatigable copyist, and his tale of lines outran in the end that of his competitors, while they took upon themselves, besides their allotted task, the important work of revision, when many a doubtful letter and difficult reading yielded to their united endeavors. And yet these insatiable scholars were not content with the palimpsest alone, Daily, for several hours, the abbot attended in the archbishop's room, and produced his treasures from the hidden closet, an armful at a time. Copious notes and extracts were made, with a view to further publications. 
and not only the men were at work. Mrs. Burkett helped her husband by copying old Arabic texts. Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. Gibson made elaborate lists of all the Arabic and Syriac manuscripts in the convent. They have since been published at Cambridge and form a valuable foundation for further research. Even I, by far the most ignorant of the party, was allowed to handle the curious old books. I could not read a line of them, but I learned to distinguish different ages in parchment and paper, and to mark how from century to century the shapes of the alphabet vary. I helped Mrs. Gibson to count and smooth the leaves of her Arabic volumes, and I ended by copying, successfully, a manuscript of Palestinian Syriac, though without understanding the meaning of the words. After a while, the abbot, partly to please Mrs. Lewis, partly to shorten his own hours of attendance, proposed that these books also should be taken into the garden to be numbered and catalogued at our convenience, and henceforth every morning one of the laborers employed in the yard came down with his hod full of manuscripts and emptied it in front of the tents. It is not astonishing that under similar treatment so many valuable records of antiquity have been lost or mutilated. My husband, who had been for many years librarian in Cambridge, felt a pang at his heart whenever he saw those coveted volumes tumbling from the basket. But a better time has come for the library on Sinai. Much attention was called to the place by the reports of our journey, and the archbishop in Cairo, though indifferent to the gospel of St. Peter, showed a most practical interest in the new discovery. He banished himself for nine months to the convent and superintended the workmen in person. One of the old vacant rooms was thoroughly restored and even furnished with glass to the windows. The manuscripts now are all neatly arranged according to number and size, and our palimpsest reposes under a glass lid in a beautifully carved box of Spanish mahogany made in Cambridge and sent out by Mrs. Lewis. Every facility is given to scholars who wish to consult the collection at stated hours in the presence of a monk, but no book is allowed to leave the room, and the worm-eaten chests and the gardener's hod have alike become things of the past. A better time for the library, certainly, yet for our personal comfort, the laxity, or rather the absence of all rules in 1893, was an unspeakable advantage. Slowly but steadily, letter upon letter and line upon line, by the help of sharp glasses and chemical agents, the long-lost gospels were brought to light. There were indeed, day by day, new doubts and new difficulties, lost pages, long gaps, unknown words, and shapeless letters. There were aching eyes also, and burning brows. But on the whole, the work prospered beyond expectation. And with all these hours of patient toil, there was hardly a day but had some special interest of its own. The walks in the rocky valley and the secret water springs, the towering granite above and the well-tended gardens below, the different sets of pilgrims and the passing caravans, the economy of the convent and our friendship with the Greek monk Nicodemus, the habits of the Bedouin women, the traders with the skins of wild animals, and the beggars to be fed at the gate. All was new and wonderful in our eyes, and time was all too short to comprehend it. Soon after our arrival, some twenty or thirty Russian pilgrims came to the convent, apparently small farmers or peasant proprietors, men and women, led by the headman, Starost, from some village in the southern steppes. They were comfortably clothed, the men in fur-trimmed coats and caps, the women in heavy woolen skirts 
and jackets with bright colored aprons and neatly folded handkerchiefs over their heads and shoulders they had guides and camels and plenty of provisions and blankets and pillows for camping out in the desert and altogether there was about them an air of rustic prosperity though they traveled without tents and most of the men had made the journey on foot they had started from their distant homes at the beginning of winter on a pilgrimage of several months to sinai and palestine probably assisted by wealthy landowners for whom they had to offer up vicarious prayers at different shrines here they were most hospitably received by the monks lodged in their guest chambers entertained at their table and escorted to all the sacred sites of the neighborhood we went to see them at dinner in the refectory a low vaulted hall lighted by a large opening in the roof with a little altar and burning candles at one end and a wooden pulpit halfway down the side monks and pilgrims sat together at the rough uncovered tables and ate with a vigorous appetite large bowls of a savory mess and huge brown loaves were pushed along the board and a merry clatter of platters and spoons accompanied the monotonous voice of the priest in the pulpit who read a greek homily during the meal after dinner the whole company including our party stood in groups near the altar where one of the monks intoned a short service of praise then followed the agape of the eastern churches a priest went round with a plate full of bread and gave us each a piece of it a second priest brought a goblet of wine and gave us to drink and chanting of prayers and responses went on all the while until we were dismissed with a blessing the rite was very much like that of the lord's supper in the reformed churches of germany but it was not the sacrament of the church on mount sinai that was celebrated early in the morning with a grand mass at the high altar the abbot would have admitted us but we did not wish to intrude and contented ourselves with some other services on sunday when incense and vestments tapers and bell ringing formed a great part of the proceedings the pilgrims stayed about a week at the convent very quietly but the day of their departure was exciting enough bedouin and camels had been summoned to carry them on their way to jerusalem and as usual on such occasions nearly twice the required number had assembled at the gate early in the morning they crowded into the yard each man insisted on being employed seized in the general scramble on some of the scattered boxes and packages proclaimed with violent gesticulations that his camel was sufficiently loaded and clamored to set out on his journey there was no dragoman to keep order and the poor russians were helpless in the hands of their numerous escort but nicodemus came to the rescue his eye and his voice seemed to carry authority with them he selected a number of camels and drivers for the caravan and expelled the others from the premises claiming obedience in the abbot's name and enforcing it when necessary by sounding blows from his staff which nobody dared to resent they retired with scowling faces and muttered curses but without further signs of resistance and those who remained were compelled to carry their allotted amount however loudly they might protest that a neighbor's beast was less heavily weighted he went from one to the other helping here to lift a load there to undo a knot and by his pleasant words and ready wit managed to restore peace and goodwill between the pilgrims and their guides but it was past midday before they were ready to start accompanied by one of the russian monks to act as arbiter in case they should fall out by the way the women mounted their camels and filed down the valley but the men stepped one after the other upon the rocky platform at the opposite side of the road and lifting their arms unto heaven prayed aloud for a blessing on the convent two of the women had to stay behind the one exhausted by previous exertions was not well enough to continue the journey 
the other acted as nurse and chaperone until they were both able to join a small caravan to tor a little seaport in the south of the peninsula the invalid required perfect rest and such restoratives as nicodemus prescribed and the convent afforded but her friend walked in the gardens and came to our tents and as i was not occupied with literary labors it fell to my lot to take her round the camp she was a middle-aged woman of splendid physique with a broad forehead and thoughtful countenance she was apparently of a very placid or even stolid temperament nothing seemed to astonish or surprise her though almost everything from the union jack overhead to the persian rug underfoot must have been new and strange to her i took her to the cook's department and showed her our english vessels and baking tins and our little cakes and sweetmeats just fresh from the oven yet her features remained immovable but all at once a large cauliflower in the gardener's basket caught her attention she took it in her arms and pressed it to her bosom her face suffused with smiles and her eyes brimming over with tears did it remind her of a far-off garden and of loving hands that tended it in her absence we could not speak to each other but our thoughts seemed to meet and we shook hands warmly at parting one touch of nature maketh the whole world kin on the last sunday before lent the abbot and the steward came down to dine with us we had sacrificed our fattest turkey in their honor and the old abbot fairly shrieked with delight when that goodly dish appeared on the board clapping his hands and smacking his lips until better employed with the portion on his plate the steward smiled pleasantly at his superior's enjoyment as you might smile at a frolicsome child he nicodemus was not a regular inmate of the place but sent here by the archbishop to put the affairs of the monastery into order to be transferred next year to another house for a similar purpose born at athens and educated for the priesthood he had travelled in distant countries and spoke three or four languages with ease he was now in his prime a true son of his church and his order in all humility and obedience yet withal of a liberal and tolerant mind he would have made a mark in any profession and seemed somewhat out of place in this wilderness among his simple and ignorant brethren it has been said that sinai is a kind of reformatory where monks from other countries are sent to expiate their offenses in solitude and privation as far as we could see our monks were docile gentle and industrious they did not indeed spend many hours in study but they had not much time to be idle being of necessity their own bakers and brewers their own tailors and shoemakers masons and carpenters the large orchards and gardens also not only here but on other slopes of the mountain gave them plenty of occupation towards us they were ever respectful and kind one old man was busy morning after morning trimming and pruning the vines on the terrace below us we stood by for some time watching with pleasure how deftly he used his scissors when he suddenly dropped them and ran away as fast as his old legs would carry him we were afraid of having offended him, but he soon returned with a basket of beautiful raisins, which he presented to us as the fruit of these, his own particular vines. Nicodemus himself was hard at work. He had to attend to repairs in the church, to new plantations of fruit trees, and to the clearing and deepening of the channels that bring water down from the mountain or he was absent for days together arranging for the necessary supplies of flour and fuel and cloth which the camels of the convent have to fetch from suez or from tor only seldom was he at leisure to come at dusk to the tents and share our afternoon tea those were pleasant half hours for all of us the feast of reason and the flow of soul and we often wondered what part nicodemus would yet 
have to play in the church of the east one evening ahmed brought a little visitor with him to the dining tent ayid the boy who had led mrs burkett's camel remembering how she enjoyed the goat's milk in the camp of mokatab the child had filled a large glass bottle a flask thrown aside by some foreign traveller with milk from his mother's goats had stoppered it with a twisted rag and carried it for eight hours across the desert as a free-will offering to his princess he had only just arrived and looked very hot and very tired but supremely happy when mrs burkett thanked him for his thoughtfulness and we all praised him for his pluck i need not say that he had a good supper and was put to bed in the most comfortable corner of the dragoman's tent we wished him to rest for a day but he was anxious to go in the morning his mother might miss him and he wanted to water his camel mrs burkett gave him a large english shawl which he draped at once dexterously round his slim little figure one corner was over his head and he looked proudly over his shoulder at the fringes that dangled at his heels as he went merrily on his way down the long valley we mothers watched the solitary child with saddening eyes until he disappeared among the rocks yet he was a true son of the desert seeing no danger in its loneliness and happy enough that morning with a new cloak with plenty of provisions for the journey and with the hope of leading his beloved mistress for another glorious ten days across the desert but that dream was not to be fulfilled hardly a week later ahmed told us with tears in his honest eyes that little ayid's camel was dead killed by the evil eye the envious eye of some neighbor to whom the boy had related in childish glee the story of his good fortune in sinai we found the same belief in the bane of the evil eye among the poor women that came for bread to the convent they carefully covered the little brown faces of their babies lest we should injure them by coveting their beauty twice every week at noon baskets of bread were let down from a window in the outer wall and hungry hands were ever ready to receive them soon after sunrise on those well-known days women and children came up from the surrounding valleys and waited patiently for the time of the loaves the children played at hide-and-seek among the rocks and made a rush for backsheesh whenever we appeared at the gate but the women sat listless on the stones by the well their husbands were most of them in the service of the monks tending their camels watering their plantations or escorting pilgrims to and fro in the desert for nearly a year no rain had fallen in this district the wells were drying up the herbage failed camels and goats were moving further south and several camps in the neighborhood had already been deserted the remaining families seemed to be destitute depending for their maintenance on the bounty of the convent. We tried to talk to the women at the well and to win their hearts by bringing them biscuits and sweets for their children, but only succeeded in making a couple of them into most impudent beggars. They followed us up and down the road, took hold of our clothes and put their hands in our pockets to see what we had brought for them. A piece of sugar, a crust of bread, a bit of string or an old button nothing came amiss to them but their great desire as indeed that of every bedouin was for shawls and handkerchiefs these make turbans and belts for the men cloaks and veils for the women and form the whole wardrobe of their infants we gave away all we could spare and were sorry that we had not brought an extra supply of them End of part one of chapter five. Part two of chapter five of our journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Part two of chapter five, Our Life in the Garden. Not knowing how much I would have to see and do in the desert, 
I had brought with me a quantity of scarlet wool and knitting needles, and I now proposed to teach one of the women to knit, that she might herself make a shawl for her baby. But my attempt was a failure. I could not understand her language. I could not even watch the expression of her face, covered as it was in Tawara fashion, by strings of coins stretched from one ear to the other, and her hands were so grimy that I had to begin my lessons by giving her a cake of soap and by instructing her how to employ it. I was vexed next day to find her little child sucking the soap, and to see no trace of its legitimate use. However, as the bright color of the wool fascinated her eyes, we might have succeeded in spite of these drawbacks, but for the men and boys who collected around us whenever they saw us at work. As soon as they approached, the woman muffled her face in her cloak, and there was an end of the lesson. But the men themselves were eager to learn. Their fingers were cleaner and quicker, and henceforth I sat many a time in a shady corner under the wall, with a tall, dark pupil beside me, and with a little crowd of spectators pressing unpleasantly nigh, until I drew a semicircle in the sand with the point of my sunshade and made them retire beyond it, not without the assistance of sundry cuffs from my privileged neighbor. I do not know how long this amusement might have lasted had not the wool been exhausted. I divided the rest among the most apt of my pupils, and promised to send them a larger supply on returning to England. We had not expected to find here so many links with the civilized world, and were quite surprised one morning when the steward asked us if we had any letters to post. A convoy of camels was going down to Tor, where coasting vessels from Suez call now and then for supplies. Our pens were quickly at work, and a goodly number of letters was given to one of the drivers, together with money sufficient to frank them at the little office in Tor. We heard afterwards that they all reached their destinations without undue delay and were fully prepaid by our amateur postman. Meanwhile, our letters, which had accumulated at the post office in Suez, were forwarded to us by another caravan that escorted a party of German sportsmen to the hunting grounds of Ferran and Sinai. They came by the same route that we had taken, and it was very amusing to receive the daily reports of their progress that were brought to us, in some incomprehensible way, by wanderers from the plain and by goat herds from the mountain. Now they were watering their camels at Garundal, now camping by the sea, and now ascending Serbal. Thus we heard of an accident that befell one of their Arab servants, wounding him seriously in the leg and delaying their arrival for several days. At length they camped in the enclosure near Palmer's Hill, and their dragoman came up at once with our letters. There were joyful hearts in our tents that night. As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Next morning the injured man was brought to the convent. He had a gunshot wound above the knee and had suffered much from loss of blood and want of surgical aid, though his employers had neglected nothing that could be done at the time. They were members of an ancient princely family in Germany, and provided most liberally for all his future wants before they left him in charge of the abbot. We called at their camp to thank them for bringing our letters, but they were out, and on returning to our tents we found their coroneted cards on the table. So we missed each other, and they left on the following day, but we saw their dragoman again. He came to borrow a handful of flour to make a little cake for his master. He was one of our former applicants, and less experienced than Ahmed. He had reckoned too much on what might be bought by the way. His flour barrel was empty, and his party had fallen back for several days on the coarse black loaves of the monks, or the unleavened cakes of the Arabs. Meanwhile the sick man was lying on some matting under an open shed in our yard. The monks would gladly have given him one of their cells, but he could not endure the confinement of their narrow walls. 
and probably the free air of the mountain helped his speedy recovery. He had his own fire, his pipe, and his coffee pot. Nicodemus acted as surgeon, a superannuated camel driver as nurse, and our cook provided beef tea and jellies, fortunately in double quantities, for the attendant enjoyed them as much as the patient. They got on capitally together, and both regretted the day when they were dismissed from this primitive hospital. Our next visitor was the old sheik from Ferran. We had never thought of seeing him again, but there he was, with his camel at the gate, in his amplest cloak and his brightest turban, and with two miserable chickens under his arm. He had promised to restore our property, so he had captured these fowls, had carried them alive forty miles across the desert, and now delivered them to us in the presence of the abbot, that his own righteousness might be apparent to all. But he had also promised to punish the offenders, so he had confiscated their goods, and brought us a belt and a powder horn as presents to atone for the sins of his people. The things were very old and curiously wrought of beaten brass, inlaid with glass beads in beautiful patterns. They would have graced any museum, and we were sorely tempted to keep them, but Nicodemus advised us to send them back to their owners. The Bedouin, so he told us, value such heirlooms most highly, and as we had to cross the desert again, they would certainly try to recover them by fair means or foul, more likely the latter. So all their misdeeds were freely forgiven. The sheik, after being well entertained at the convent, returned rejoicing to his tents, and our much-tried chickens rejoined their companions in the orchard, and lived in comfort and plenty to the end of their days. From the first we had planned to stay a month on Mount Sinai, then to go slowly northward and to spend Easter in Jerusalem. But as week after week passed by, our students saw that they could not finish their work in time. Another fortnight at least would be wanted, and they had all to resume their regular duties in Cambridge at the beginning of next term. So we had to decide either leave the present task incomplete, or give up our visit to the Holy Land. We were all assembled in council, and, whatever our secret longings for Jerusalem, we were brave enough to vote as one man for the work on Sinai. Ahmed, indeed, objected that his provisions were not calculated for so prolonged a stay, but the monks were ready to help, and we sent a couple of men with a camel to Suez, two hundred miles to the nearest grocer's shop, to buy what else we required. They would also, we hoped, bring us another batch of letters, and as the time approached for that camel's return, our daily walk was down to the plain, where we strained our eyes after every dark speck that appeared on the sand in the distance. Now it was a solitary monk coming home from an outlying plantation, now a Bedouin woman collecting her goats for the night, now a messenger from Ferran on his swift trotting camel, or a whole household moving from camp to camp, mother and child sitting high above tent poles and furniture, and the patriarchal husband striding along by the side. Thus we watched one evening a file of camels coming across the plain towards Wadi Edir, we made out the dark features and bright-colored turbans of the drivers, but the figures of the riders remained incomprehensible. Fair faces and yellow beards, with long white cloaks, and cowls tied with camel hair string, like those of the Algerian Arabs. At length Professor Bensley went up to one of the leaders and addressed him, at a venture, in English. The riddle was solved. This was a party of priests from the Dominican convent of St. Stephen at Jerusalem, which is a kind of training school for Roman Catholic clergy, who come there from all parts of the world for two years at a time 
to study the history of Christianity at its cradle. The young men whom we now met were on a holiday tour with their prior, and the white robes of their order were well adapted to a journey through the desert. They came from Germany, Belgium, and Scotland, and belonged to a much higher class of society than the monks on Sinai. Christian scholars and gentlemen, they showed their superior breeding by the pleasant way in which they conformed to the wishes and habits of their hosts. Though, like us, they had brought their own tents and provisions, they willingly shared the cells and the table of the convent, and joined in all its religious observances, merging the minor distinctions of Eastern and Western in the community of the Holy Catholic Church. In a similar way, our Roman Catholic cook attended the convent mass every morning, and, strange to say, it was our Mohammedan dragoman who first obtained that permission for him by applying straight to the abbot. After a week on Mount Sinai, the prior, with his party, went on towards Petra, they started early in the morning and expected to have a hot ride across the plain, for the weather had changed with the beginning of March. When we arrived, the snow indeed had disappeared from the top of the mountain, and the sun felt hot enough in the middle of the day. But the mornings and evenings were chilly, and once we had so sharp a frost during the night that our negro found a sheet of ice on his wash tub. Amazed at this miracle, the like of which he had never seen, he managed to detach the transparent disc and carried it carefully around the camp, holding it up before his face like a looking-glass and calling aloud for admiration. I am afraid he thought us very callous. We certainly did not share his joy, but wished for warmer weather. In our sheltered valley, well provided with blankets and rugs, we did not actually suffer from cold, but the mountain that protected us from rough winds also deprived us of sunshine. Early in the afternoon the sun dipped below Gebel Musa, and we often went down to the plain to enjoy its warmth for another hour at least, after it had set at the convent. But its power increased only too rapidly, and ere long morning and evening had become the pleasantest part of the day. At noon, the flat rocks by the roadside felt burning hot to the touch, and the little washstand at which the transcribers worked throughout the day had to be moved from place to place into the double shadow of tents and of trees. The camel drivers complained of dried-up wells, the goatherds found no water for their flocks, and the monks began to look anxiously at the state of their reservoirs. But on the morning of March ninth, a little cloud arose from the plain like a man's hand. Before noon, the whole heaven was black with clouds. The mist clung in white folds to the sides of the gorge, and at dinner time, the long desired rain descended in torrents. Our servants had dug trenches outside the tents to carry off the water, and we were busy inside covering our books and papers with waterproofs and umbrellas. But we might have saved ourselves that trouble. Though the rain continued all night, and the clattering, pattering sound on the canvas kept us awake, hardly a drop of it entered the tent, and the matting on the sandy floor was perfectly dry in the morning. After breakfast, wind and rain subsided. The mist lifted like a veil from the face of the earth, and the sun reappeared in its splendor, while we remembered and realized the words of the poet, how the water comes down at Lodore. Here it came, roaring and pouring and rushing and gushing and rumbling and tumbling from the granite heights down to the wadis and wells of the desert. And here it fell from the cliffs overhead, dashing and splashing, brightening and whitening, hopping and dropping and dancing and glancing as it filled all the cisterns and tanks of the convent. As we walked abroad an hour later, the steep path was already dry and clean, but between the rocks on either side were deep, transparent pools, and here the women washed their clothes and the babies 
paddled knee-deep in the water like English children in a summer sea. The monks were joyfully at work in their plantations, making ditches round every tree that not a single root might miss its full share of the flood that poured in abundantly from the opened sluice gates of the large reservoir. Truly the blessing from on high that filleth all things living with plenteousness. A new wealth of blossoms awoke in gardens and orchards, and a faint blush of spring came even to the barren desert. The ragged tufts of rumph, the rough grass that is the chief food of the camels, put forth new blades. The bedaran between the stones broke into a fragrant heather-like bloom of the palest golden-brown tint. Velvety leaves resembling our sage peeped from the crevices in the granite, and a kind of dandelion growing close to the ground shone in yellow clusters at the foot of the crags. Small sand-colored lizards sunned themselves on the top of the garden wall, and pretty little birds, a sort of canary, fluttered from branch to branch and picked up crumbs near the tents. A curious black swallow seemed to build its nest in the rocks above, and a flock of large black crows settled on the cypress trees or on the roofs of the convent, while now and then a vulture drew its circles high up in the sunny sky. As the days lengthened, so also our walks became more and more extended. We had no dangers to fear. The rocks were steep, but the rough granite gave a secure foothold, and huge boulders tossed one upon the other formed in many places a practicable stairway. The natives whom we met in our rambles seemed to know and respect us as guests of the convent. The women and children were inveterate beggars, but the men passed by in stately dignity, with the usual salutation of, Blessed be thy day, except once or twice when one of my pupils, who knitted as he walked along the plain, asked me politely to pick up a fallen stitch. The howling of a jackal was now and then heard in the night, but all that we saw of wild beasts in the mountains was a couple of panther and hyena skins offered for sale by a wandering Bedouin. One of our favorite expeditions was to reach a solitary cypress that grew on the opposite side of the valley, about 400 feet above the path, on what seemed, from below, a narrow ledge of a bare and precipitous wall. But there were mounds of fallen stones at the base, larger and smaller blocks of granite higher up, vertical clefts with broken sides, little hollow watercourses between cliff and cliff, and projections and cavities in the rock itself to help in the ascent, that, after all, required more ingenuity than strength, and from different sides and in different ways, climbing and creeping, turning and twisting, going up and down and from right to left in search of an easier stepping stone or a safer slope, we accomplished the feat again and again. The cypress stood on a kind of natural balcony, where the spring that trickled from the rock at the back had hollowed for itself a regular basin, and here a matted bed of reeds had grown up around the roots of the tree. On a lower platform, just in front of it, some rough boulders formed a semicircular seat, and a row of five upright stones at the edge of the cliff looked hardly like the handiwork of nature. We saw no other trace of human habitation, but probably this was the site of some sanctuary in early Christian or even in anti-Christian times. We had from this height a beautiful bird's-eye view of the convent. Seen from here, the massive rampart that surrounds the monastic buildings, and the lower yet hardly less substantial stone fence that encloses the cultivated ground, seemed like a strong sea-wall that secures some fruitful island from the inroads of the ocean. Within were the crowded roofs with tower and dome, the intricate passages and galleries with the humble habitations of the monks, and luxurious masses of foliage and flower that completely hid our little tents beneath their summer splendor. Without was nothing but rock and sand, no sign of life or vegetation, 
no trace of the hand of man. To the left, the gorge grew narrower and wilder as it rose to the top of the pass. On the right, it wound slowly down to the plain of Eraca that shimmered white in the distance. About an hour's walk from the convent took us some way across that sunny ground to one of the several wells that are here assigned to the rod of Moses. It came from a narrow rift in the granite under a sheltering cliff, and a young acacia made a cool bower above the little rocky pool, full of mosses and water weeds. We caught the tiny rill in our hands as it fell from the rock above, and we followed it on its course over the large boulders that formed the stepping stones to this fountain in the wilderness, until it was swallowed up by the thirsty sands below. In a neighboring valley, on a plateau surrounded by a theater of picturesque rocks, we came upon the lately deserted camp of a numerous tribe. At first sight it looked like a burnt-out village. Little enclosures or roofless huts of loose stones, carefully piled together, are here used instead of tents, which would be difficult to pitch on this rocky and uneven ground and these primitive walls had been well scorched and blackened by the continual fires, while heaps of cinders and refuse were still lying in secluded corners where wind and rain had not been able to dislodge them. We saw only a few small holes, half full of muddy water, but there must have been a good supply of it at some earlier time. The traces of camels and goats were abundant, almond and olive trees had sprung up in wild disorder and a beautiful palm stood as lonely mourner above the desolate camp a few miles further was a rosy plantation of fruit trees belonging to the monks with its well and water tanks and with a little house for temporary shelter the whole secured and isolated by the usual stone fence from the barren desert without Another pleasant walk was past Palmer's Hill, where we got a pretty view of the convent with its flowering gardens in front, set like a picture in the narrow window frame of the little hut, and then along Wadi es Sheik to watch the graceful capers of the black goats up and down the steep cliffs as they searched for the precious herbage which the recent rains had made to spring from the crevices. Their guardian angel, in the shape of a little maiden in dark blue draperies, sat motionless on the top of a rock, but at eventide she descended as nimbly as one of her kids, and in silent grace led the way down the long valley, followed by her lively flock that scampered merrily after her, though loath to leave their playground on the mountainside, for the fences and fires of the camp that guarded them at night from four-footed and two-footed marauders. Now and then one of the little creatures would linger behind, until it suddenly bounded in flying leaps from the very height of the mountain, and ran in ridiculous haste to rejoin its companions, just as they disappeared in the distance. I need not say that the girl varied the monotony of her life by coming down from her throne and clamoring for backsheesh whenever she caught sight of the travelers from the convent. The best view of our valley we obtained from the top of Gebel Monega, a cone-shaped hill of greenish porphyry that stands like a watchtower at the very head of the gorge. Seen from here, it stretches in one straight line down to Eraka. The steep rocks on either side are never less than 1,000 feet high, and their rugged slopes seem to meet in the middle, only the narrowest possible bridle path leading down to the plain. The convent stands about halfway down, the gardens are hidden from sight, and the massive walls, though utterly dwarfed by the mountains around, seem but to add to the general wildness by barring the only available pass. On the other side, Gable Monega looks down the wide valley Tarfa to the far-off green pastures by the southern sea. Our longest and most interesting excursion, the ascent of the great mountain itself, was deferred to the last week, when we, dwellers in the flattest and sandiest county of England, had become duly familiar with the dizzy heights, precipitous cliffs, 
and rough stony footpaths of our temporary home. End of Part 2 of Chapter 5「Chapter Six of Our Journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter Six: The Mountain. Sinai or Horeb is the ancient name of this mighty mountain that rises in one broad mass from the very foundations of the earth, but lifts three separate heads unto heaven. This group, consisting of Ras es Sasafa, the head of the willow tree, Gebel Musa, and Gebel Catherine, though it belongs to the same primary formation, is in itself quite distinct from Mount Serbal, that stands at a distance of two days' journey near the fertile oasis of Feran, though the same appellation of Sinai is sometimes given to the whole province of granite, that stretches over thirty miles from north to south to distinguish it from the limestone plateau of the Tich and from the sandy flats of Arabia. Serbal is the most prominent single mountain of the peninsula. Its proud serrated head is seen from all points of the compass, and many learned treatises have been written on the question whether Serbal or Gebel Musa be the Sinai of the Bible. If Ferran, the city of the Amalekites, as it was still called in the early days of the Christian era, is identical with Rephidim, then Serbal can hardly be the mountain of the law, for the oasis lies so close at its feet that the people of Israel need not have departed from Rephidim to camp before the mount. Exodus 19.2 also, Serbal does not rise immediately or abruptly from the plain. Much difficult and even dangerous ground has to be surmounted before the traveler faces the real ascent, and the injunction of Moses not to draw near the mountain nor to touch the border of it, Exodus 19.12, would here have been superfluous. On the other hand, though the plain of Erbaca is wide enough for the largest encampment, and its mountain seems to grow straight up from the ground like a gigantic pulpit. The whole district looks today so dry and desolate that a wise leader like Moses would hesitate to choose it as a resting place for his people and his flocks. And yet there are many springs among the rocks, and the orchards on different slopes of the mountain do not seem to suffer from drought. The seasons also vary even now very much as to the amount of their rainfall. Two or three successive storms, like the one we witnessed, would fill for a time all the watercourses of the plain. But whatever the learned and scientific arguments may do for the different theories, tradition has ever kept true to this three-headed mountain of Sinai, and we certainly were not inclined to doubt its authority. According to this, Mount Safsafa, which faces the plain, is the place whence Moses spoke to the people, with his face shining from the presence of God, as he descended from the somewhat higher top of Gebel Musa, that rises immediately behind the convent, half hidden by its two companions from the popular gaze. Only from the highest point of our valley could we see the summit of that holy mountain with its little chapel, that is pointed out as the very spot where Moses received the law, and is visited by worshippers and sightseers from all parts of the world. Gebel Catherine, the highest of the three, stands a little to the west, and bears the name of the saint whose body the angels are said to have buried here after her martyrdom at Alexandria. It is, in fact, separated from the mass that makes up Gebel Musa and Gebel Safsafa by a deep gorge. On the south side, towards Wadi Tarfa, the mountain is not quite so steep, and there Abbas Pasha ordered a carriage road to be constructed, that he might comfortably drive to the top. Rocks were blasted, boulders removed, holes filled up, and the wide sweeps of the projected road can be followed to and fro along the lower slopes. 
but the death of the sultan put a sudden stop to it and the sharp stones that still cover all the cuttings are so painful to the feet of camels and men that so far the work is of no practical value and the steps of the pilgrims that are mentioned already in the time of empress helena remain to this day the usual path to the top of the holy mountain a little wicket in the upper boundary wall of the gardens brought us straight to the foot of the rocks near one of the deep vertical clefts that form a peculiar feature of the synactic range and here we soon found the first of the three thousand steps that lead for as many feet almost straight up to the summit the ancient monks or pilgrims who thus cut their way to the height made the very best use of every possible foothold or vantage ground of every natural crevice or projection and the steps in consequence are most irregular in shape and size intermitted now and then when a rainwater channel or shelving ridge offers a different mode of ascent and lost altogether in some sheltered hollow or level breathing place but no guide is required to find them again going higher and higher along the face of the cliff and formidably steep as they look from below they are tiring indeed but not dangerous here are no loose rolling stones no slippery treacherous inclines the granite of sinai is firm and true like its law that abideth for ever for the first half hour we went up one side of the above-mentioned cleft so steeply that we looked down on the pavement of the narrow courts below until turning a corner of the cliff we lost convent and valley from sight and were surrounded on all sides by the towering granite no rain or snow had worn away the edges no moss or lichen softened the outlines sharp and bare it glittered in the sunshine with its long white veins of quartz and its cup-like hollows the bubbles of a seething mass many millenniums ago we rested a while near an overhanging rock where a secret spring had formed a transparent pool fringed with the most delicate of maidenhair ferns the large green leaves of some strange water plant were floating on the top and we watched the slender stems curling upwards in golden green spirals and saw the fan-shaped roots clinging to the granite below a rudely carved inscription in praise of allah the most merciful showed that other pilgrims had lingered here and enjoyed the cool fragrance of this hidden aquarium a few hundred steps more brought us to the little chapel of the virgin it is built of rough hewn blocks and looks like a piece of the rock against which it leans except for the whitewash on roof and window sill the monks hold a service here once a month they had also lately effected some repairs and their ladders and other implements that were still lying about gave a less forsaken look to the solitary sanctuary some chroniclers affirm this to be the site of the original monastery for whose sake justinian built the fortress lower down others tell us that the monks of st catherine were at one time so pestered by fleas that they emigrated in a body to seek for a cleaner abode but here they were met by the virgin who ordered them to return to their shrines and promised to rid them of their enemies and indeed they vanished at the very same hour but travelers who have lately slept in the convent maintain it is time for such a miracle to be repeated just opposite to the door of the chapel our steps began anew as steep as ever and ere long they passed under a narrow arch between two perpendicular rocks formerly a priest used to sit here and all who went up the mountain made their confessions to him and received absolution the same ceremony was repeated under a similar arch higher up and only thus doubly shriven were the pilgrims allowed to proceed on their way and to attend the solemn mass on the summit the tall green head of a cypress that seemed suddenly to look down on us peeping over the edge of a gigantic cliff 
was a strange surprise in this barren wilderness, and made us climb upward with additional zeal. About two thousand feet above the convent lies a wide, shallow basin, surrounded on three sides by towering heights, but open towards the sunny south, and here we had the first free view over the mountains and valleys below us, as we emerged from the network of narrow gorges and deep ravines through which we had hitherto ascended. It was a warm, quiet morning, no movement in the air, no murmuring brook, no sound of bird or beast, a primeval silence indeed to listen for the still, small voice. The chapel, dedicated from ancient times to the prophet Elijah, who is said to have dwelt in the cave underneath, stands in the midst of the hollow, and is of the simplest construction, built of the granite around it. In the little enclosure in front grow a few stunted herbs, and the magnificent cypress, whose roots must have found a hidden spring deep down in the clefts of the rock, to maintain the evergreen crown in its solitary beauty. The chapel is opened only once a month, and we had regretted that we could not time our visit accordingly, but I doubt whether any voices of priests and choirs could have been more impressive than this holy, all-encompassing silence and solitude. The engineers of Abbas Pasha had nearly reached the chapel when they were stopped, fortunately, before disturbing the precincts of the prophet. We had to climb another 1,000 feet higher on rough-hewn stairs, cut in the solid rock as before, but we were no longer hemmed in by cavernous cliffs. We now ascended the sacred summit itself, and the prospect widened with every step. There, on the open mountainside, patches of snow still whitened the shady corners, and a transparent crust covered the brooklet by the side of the path but nevertheless it tripped merrily downstairs, unimpeded by its icy canopy. At length, instead of the eternal granite, rough masses of masonry appeared overhead. Only five minutes more, and we landed on a little platform on the very top of Gebel Musa. The chapel and the mosque that stand side by side on the edge of the precipice are substantially built and carefully whitewashed but without any further attempt at ornamentation. A little altar with a cross above, and the Qibla with a few Arabic texts, distinguish them sufficiently from each other, and no human art or skill could enhance the sanctity and beauty of the place. Yet a fallen column and some old foundations show that a church of larger dimensions stood here in days gone by. We sat down at once on these ancient remains, and began eagerly to eat our Kamar ed Din, the dry apricot jam of the Bedouins. Do not think that we were insensible to the spiritual charms of the mountain, but climbing it had been an arduous task, and for the moment food and rest were our chief desire. The view from this point, 8,000 feet above the sea, takes in the whole of the peninsula, except to the west, where Gebel Catherine, separated from Gebel Musa, only by a narrow ravine, rises yet three hundred or four hundred feet higher, and shuts out the Gulf of Suez and the caravan route by Gerundel. But Gebel Catherine itself, with its riven sides and its buttresses of darkest granite, is a sight not easily forgotten. Towards the north, the broad bluff of Ras es Safsafa, though considerably lower, hides the wide plain of Eraka, but the sandstone region beyond and the desert of the wanderings, the limestone plateau of the Tich, are clearly discerned in the distance. Mount Safsafa takes its name from the sacred willow that grows near a spring on its western slope. The Bedouin believe it to be the very tree from which Moses cut his miraculous rod. The valley of the monastery lies too near the base of the steep ascent to be seen from above, but the valley as Sheik and the long valley of Tarfa can be easily traced in the wonderful labyrinth of Gebel and Wadi that stretches south and east, 
far away to where the green pastures beyond Tor and the blue sea of Aqaba bound the horizon. At this height the little nooks where orchards and gardens flourish are entirely lost in the gigantic wilderness of stone. Nothing meets the eye but naked rocks and barren gullies, and yet the granite varies so much in color, according to its principal components, from black and darkest red and green down to a soft rose tint or silvery gray, and the sunlit summits and deep narrow clefts add so many changes of light and shade that the whole becomes a picture of indescribable beauty. We sat long in silence on the summit of Sinai. A thunderstorm here would be awful indeed. But today the wind was hushed and the sky transparently blue. Far below us, three large black crows floated in the sunny air, as if to remind us that life was not quite extinct in the earth. We had traveled so far, we had looked forward so long to this ascent of the mountain, and now the achievement seemed like unto a dream, a dream from which we did not wish to be awakened. The air was so balmy, and the sunshine so genial, the view so unspeakably grand, Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee, was the involuntary cry of the soul. And yet we had to go down. Alas, for the prose of life, we had to go downstairs to dinner, for here we had nothing to drink, and we must needs reach the tents before nightfall. Generally, going down is easier than going up, but in this case we found it otherwise partly because we had now to face the steep precipices below us, partly because we were not so fresh as in the morning, we certainly proceeded slower and more cautiously than before. It seemed often difficult to find a safe place for the foot in descending, and at times we preferred to sit down and to slide slowly and gently from step to step, like little children on their nursery stairs. The afternoon sun shone full on the whitened roofs of the convent when we came out once more from the intricate clefts of the mountains into our own familiar valley, though as yet many hundred feet from treetops and tents. Another half hour's careful climbing, and we stood again, safe and sound, at the foot of the rocks whence we had started, well shod in the morning, now our boots were in a deplorable state, for so sharp is the granite on those primitive paths that it literally cut the leather into pieces, and the soles were left, bit by bit, on the steps of the pilgrims. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of our journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Chapter seven Homeward Bound. March twentieth was fixed for our departure. Unfortunately, in eighteen ninety three, this was the first day of Ramadan, the Mohammedan Lent. As this always begins with a new moon, it is movable like our Easter tide, but instead of only shifting from March into April, it moves slowly with every thirteenth moon through all the seasons of the year, and the exact date of its annual reoccurrence is not easy to remember. We had not taken it into consideration when making our plans. During this month of fasting, the true believers are commanded to abstain from food and drink as long as they can distinguish a black thread from a white one, that is, from sunrise to sunset. When at home, they make up for it by feasting at night, taking all possible rest in the day. But on a journey, this becomes inconvenient. Our dragoman, indeed, availed himself of a clause in the Koran, which absolves travelers for the days actually spent on the road providing they prolong their fast into the following month, and feed, moreover, 
six beggars on each of the days thus transposed. Some of the drivers followed Ahmed's example, but others, too true to the letter of the law, or more probably too poor to comply with the feeding of beggars, bore bravely the heat and the dust of the day without taking any refreshment, not even a whiff from their pipes. All the more were they ready to eat on the 19th when they brought their camels up to the convent to camp near the well as before. My old friends, Alan and Ibrahim, were almost the first to arrive. My husband and Mr. Burkett also soon recognized their old camels and drivers among the assembly. Poor little Ayid was absent. Without a camel, he was no longer of any use in the caravan. This time we not only gave them a sheep to prepare for themselves, our cook was busy all day seething large pieces of goat's flesh in his cauldron. Women and children had come up in larger numbers than usual, and bread and meat, with biscuits and oranges, were liberally distributed among them. The children were especially delighted with the odds and ends usually thrown away in a household removal. Empty matchboxes and battered mustard tins, old envelopes and broken pens, all made acceptable toys for these youngsters, and they held a high carnival on the rocks outside. Our own last dinner in the garden inside was less successful. Ahmed, always intent on varying our meals to the best of his power, had, some time ago, purchased a kid from a passing tribe, and, not finding it fat enough for his purpose, had taken the mother into the bargain. She was tethered in a corner out of the way, where she found plenty of succulent food, while the little one had the free run of the camp. It was perfectly black, playful as a kitten, and soon became a general favorite. It frisked in and out of the tents, ate from our hands, and sniffed at our pockets. We quite forgot the purpose for which it had been bought, and never stopped to think, yon playful kid must die. Busy this day with packing and photographing, we had hardly missed our little pet, and it was a painful shock at dinner time when Ahmed himself triumphantly bore it into the tent, dished with tomatoes and covered with gravy. Out of regard for the dragoman's feelings, one or two of the gentlemen took a little piece on their plate, but we all turned away from the sight, and it did much to deepen the natural depression that is connected with every parting in this troublesome world. Early next morning our tents were struck, our water casks filled, our chickens recaptured and caged, and before noon the baggage train moved slowly towards the plain to prepare a new camp for us in Wadi es Sheik. Meanwhile, Professor Bensley and his two coadjutors were still quietly at work. The tents removed, they repaired to the well. Tables and chairs folded up, they sat on a tree trunk with a book on their knees. Inkstand and blotting books gone, they took to their pencils. Every minute was precious. The book of the Gospels had not only had the writing washed out by its ancient possessors, it had been entirely taken to pieces. When at last bound together once more to form the receptacle of this new martyrology, some of the leaves had been lost, other parchments had got mixed in with the rest, half of them were turned upside down, and hardly two sheets remained in their consecutive order. The identification of the separate pages formed no small part of our work, but great progress had been made during the last fortnight, and it had been delightful to watch how verses and sentences recovered from different parts of the volume came together, crystallized as it were, into chapters and paragraphs. Now nearly the whole of the three hundred pages was copied, nearly each of the doubtful variations was doubly revised. Nearly all the wonderful work was accomplished. Nearly. Oh, for a few more days to give it the finishing touch. But 
time was up. The University of Cambridge recalled her professor. The steamer at Alexandria would not delay. The camels, once summoned to the convent, could not be kept without fodder. And we had to go to the room of the abbot to bid him goodbye. For the first time we found him in his ampler robes, with the heavy gold chain and jeweled cross that are the badge of his office. Maybe that the quiet presence of the great English professor, for whom he had shown all along a dumb kind of reverence, had unconsciously influenced his manner and mien. He certainly made a better figure today than when he received us some six weeks ago. His table was covered with charters and plans and other ancient relics of the convent, and in the middle stood a silver dish full of transparent gold-colored grain, the manna of the Bible, as the monks believe it to be. It is the resin that oozes and drops from the tarfa tree, a dwarfed kind of terebinth, during the hottest months of the year. The Bedouins spread their cloaks on the ground and collect the sweet grains in the morning. They taste, indeed, like wafers made with honey, but have, in addition, a decidedly turpentine flavor. We were all presented with tiny boxes of manna, and though, in the course of a year or two, it has shaken down and melted into a wax-like compound, its taste remains unaltered to this day. The abbot next opened the visitor's book, and we looked at the list of distinguished travelers who, from times immemorial, have visited this place. Probably there exists no other volume of the kind that has among its entries so large a proportion of well-known and illustrious names. I was timid about adding my own to so royal a register, but I found that I had the distinction of being the first German woman whose signature appears in this book. May I have many successors. We had signed our names, returned our books, and made the usual donations to the chest of the convent. The abbot had given to each of us a small golden ring with a monogram of St. Catherine, in memory of our visit to her shrine, and we had taken a solemn farewell of each other in Greek and in English. The riding camels had been sent forward to Palmer's Hill, and we were to follow on foot, but went first quietly to take leave of the garden, of our snug little home in the desert. We found it occupied by strangers, a party of American travelers, a father with two Nimrod-like sons, had arrived and pitched their tents while we were engaged with the abbot. A new dragoman and cook were installed by the well. A new dining tent occupied the center of the ground. A new flag with stars and stripes was hoisted instead of the Union Jack. And already our place knew us no more. Like the Russian pilgrims, we stopped a while on the rocks on the other side of the road to take a long last look at the convent. And again and again, as we went slowly down the winding path, whose every furlong was now familiar to our feet, did we turn to catch another glimpse of those white roofs and blossoming trees with the towering granite behind them. The day had been one of the hottest and had made us dread the coming ten days in the desert, but as we emerged from the narrow valley, a fresh breeze met us, blowing from the north across the plain of Araka. We did not now cross it, but turned to the right, eastward, and walked through the pleasant evening hours by the side of our camels, down the wide valley as Sheik, until the sun set behind us and the campfires gleamed in the distance. Not only our own this time, a large Bedouin tribe, migrating from winter to summer pastures, was resting in the bend of the valley, and their singing and shouting, together with the barking of their dogs and the growling of their camels, resounded far into the night, for they had kept the first day of Ramadan, and were now released by the darkening sky from their fasting. Henceforth, Ahmed had a special gong sounded at the precise moments of sunrise and sunset, 
to remind our followers of their religious duties. The wind remained in the north the next fortnight, and though at times disagreeable enough to fill our eyes with sand and to blister our faces, it tempered the noonday heat to such a degree that we felt it less oppressive now at the end of March than during our journey in January. Moreover, the clouds whose blessing we had witnessed in the mountain had swooped down on the lowlands also with healing in their wings, and though the watercourses seemed now as dry as ever, the effects of a recent passage of waters were apparent on every side. In the fresher blades of the rumph, in the stronger scent of the bed heron, and even in tiny flowerets like diminutive daisies that just peeped here and there from the sun-baked soil, as if afraid of lifting their pale golden eyes above the sandy surface. Repeatedly we rested among the groups of tarfa trees, pleasantly green to the eyes, though the brittle branches showed no sign of the sweet resin that exudes from them later in the year. The juniper bushes that studded some of the lower reaches were covered with white flower spikes, and would not have looked amiss in an English shrubbery, and altogether this side of the mountain seemed less barren and desolate than the way by which we had come up. The days were longer now, yet we rose with the sun as before. We had a good rest in the middle of the day, and nightly pitched our wandering tents a day's march nearer home. The summit of Sinai was hidden, only too soon, by intervening heights, but Serbal reappeared in its glory, black, purple, or blue, according to the distance or the time of day. It seemed to accompany us, like a faithful friend, during the greater part of the week. We exchanged the dark, massive cones of granite for the many clefted and many colored sandstone whose fantastical shapes our imagination construed into temple gates and gigantic sphinxes, and our camels made wide detours whilst we scrambled over rocky ridges or down steep inclines into some lower valley, until the hills became rounder and the watercourses shallower and we struck once more into Wadi Shebeka to return by our former route via Gurundal to Suez. Our buried bottles were easily recovered, and their sparkling contents proved a great comfort during our last three days in the desert, which managed somehow to be the most trying of all the campaign. We spent a quiet Sunday among the palms of Gurundal, under a gray and hazy sky a very unusual sight in that district. The wind had gone down, the broad green fans of the doom palm had forgotten their waving. The camels seemed to sleep through the live long day, and a drowsy silence brooded over the camp. The natives prophesied a storm, but though a few heavy drops fell in the afternoon, and the men began to dig rain trenches about the tents, no disturbance occurred during the night. Next morning the wind blew hard from the north, but still the sun was hidden by that strange haze that seemed to deepen as we rode on. A Turkish officer and his orderly joined our cavalcade. They were on duty, bound from Tor to Suez, and though mounted on swift-trotting camels, preferred to ride slowly by our side for the sake of the greater security which larger numbers afford. A stray dog had also, a few days before, attached itself to our company. Nobody knew whence it came. It was seen in the heat of the day, limping painfully by the side of the camels, and snapping up greedily a morsel of bread that somebody threw to it. At the next halt we gave it some water, and in the evening it was regaled with chicken bones and found a place by the kitchen fire. Henceforth it became an inseparable member of the caravan, and changed so much in appearance that its owners, if indeed it ever had an owner, would not have known it again. Emaciated, mangy, and wolfish looking when we first made its acquaintance, it soon got sleek, well-conditioned, and frolicsome, never tired of wagging its tail or of licking the hands of its benefactors. But today 
even the dog partook of the general depression. At midday a tent was summoned from the rear to protect us from the wind and from the flying grit that threatened to mix with our food. So we lunched under canvas, and when, on resuming our ride, we discovered from the top of a sand ridge, first the long range of the African mountains, and then a shining belt of dark blue sea, we forgot all present discomforts and hailed the beautiful sight with loud exclamations of joy, like the Thalassa, Thalassa of old. But soon everything in front of us was obscured by a dark yellowish cloud. Did it advance towards us, or did we ride bodily into it? I do not know. Suddenly the sandstorm was upon us. Like sharp needles it stung our faces, but only for a moment. My camel wheeled instantly round and stood perfectly still, its legs wide apart and its long neck hanging down to the ground, while the storm raged on from behind. Other camels were made to lie down, and rider and driver found some shelter to leeward. But my Ibrahim managed to be absent, my eyes were perfectly blinded with dust, and I could not dismount without any assistance. So I drew my cloak over my face, bowed low on my pommel, and tried to emulate my camel in patience. Hardly ten minutes, and the storm had swept by. Fortunately, it was only the hem of its garment that had thus overshadowed us. The thick cloud passed away to the south, but the air was still full of fine particles of sands that shone like so much silver in the rays of the sun. Seen through this medium, the nearest objects looked like gigantic specters moving in the distance. Slowly the atmosphere cleared, and camels and men resumed their normal proportions. My husband had indeed been close to me all the time, though hidden for a while, as it were, in the valley of the shadow of death. How happy to find him again, face to face, in the full perfection of daylight! Our guides, bewildered by the storm, had become uncertain as to the direction of the baggage train, and wandered from right to left for the next hour or two, in vain endeavors to find a trace of their comrades. At length, some landmark on the horizon gave us a clue, and led us, though later than usual, in safety to our camp in Wadi Sadr. The wind was still high, there had been some trouble in setting up the tents, and the men were busily shoveling and piling up sand to keep the curtains down to the ground. We had to go to bed without candles. At midnight, the canvas just over my head was nearly torn away by a sudden blast, and in a neighboring tent the washstand collapsed with all its belongings. It took some time before order was restored in the dark, but Ahmed and his faithful satellites kept patrolling the camp tightening the ropes and hammering down the tent pegs, and we fell sound asleep again, notwithstanding our rocking poles and our flapping curtains. The following day was warm and clear, without a speck on sky or sand to mar their dazzling blue and white, a perfect day of the desert. The wind was still in our face, but it now blew softly, straight from the sea and from the mountains beyond, and the well-remembered head of Mount Ataka, the guardian of Suez, was already in sight. Our return journey had, by contract, been divided into ten equal stages of twenty to twenty-five miles a day, and hitherto we had strictly adhered to that program without undue fatigue for man and beast. But lately Mrs. Lewis and Mr. Harris, intent on forwarding certain letters to Europe, by an earlier mail, had inclined to forced marches, and, finding my husband and myself unable to join them, they now decided on pushing on without us, accompanied by several attendants and by a certain number of baggage camels, hoping to reach Suez twenty-four hours before the rest of the caravan. We readily agreed, but realized only at the moment of starting 
that the dragoman also was to be part of their party. We did not like to interfere with his arrangements, but I confess we did not feel comfortable camping in the desert without that paternal protector, especially as we were now in a comparatively inhabited district not far from Ayan Musa, and might experience another night scene like that at Ferran. However, Mrs. Burkett, as good an interpreter as Ahmed himself, remained with us. We trusted to her powers of persuasion, in case of any difficulty with the natives, and though our slumbers were somewhat disturbed by dreams of shrieking fowls and felonious sheiks, we fared on the whole none the worse for this desertion. In the morning, indeed, Ahmed's absence was felt in the leisurely way of packing and saddling. We started at nine instead of seven, and rode for the first time in company with the whole caravan. But as there remained for us only half a day's ride to the place of embarkation, we could afford to take it easy. At eleven o'clock we reached Ayan Musa, wandered a while among its palm trees and water springs, and found enough biscuit and kamar eddin in our saddlebags to make up for the dragoman's luncheon box. Before noon we were once more under way, first straight down to the sea, then northward along the barren, desolate shore, while the mountains and the town of Tufikaya and Suez, and large steamers bound for the canal, and a whole fleet of fishing boats with huge brown sails bathed in brightest sunshine, made a beautiful panorama on the opposite side of the gulf. We soon recognized the little breakwater where we sat on our luggage two months ago and waited in vain for the camels. But today the wind was too strong for sailing against it, and we had ridden several miles further when the welcome figure of Ahmed seemed suddenly to rise up from the sea. He had taken his traveler safely to the hotel at Suez, and had recrossed early this morning to come to our assistance. As our sheik, with his men and camels, was to be dismissed on this side of the Red Sea, not only we ourselves, with our servants and other belongings, but also the properties of the dragoman, tents, furniture, cooking utensils, and all that remained of the stores, had here to be shipped. Six chickens were all that survived of our poultry, and these, though much reduced by their ten days' ride, were destined as a valuable present for Ahmed's wife. Fowls fattened on the holy mountains would be without peers in all Egypt. To transfer so many goods from the camels to the large cargo boat, lying some way off the shore, as the water was too shallow for her to come in, proved a tedious affair. The boatmen, with their petticoats girt about their loins, had to carry each separate bale on head and shoulders for twenty or thirty yards through the water that rose up to their waist as they staggered with their heavy burdens to the side of the boat. These fine bronze-colored men, clad above in loose white shirts, embroidered waistcoats and bright turbans, while their drenched nether garments clung close to their limbs, did not look unlike the legendary mermen of old with their wet and slimy tails as they rose half out of the water to receive a new load from the dragoman. We had ample time to give a last biscuit to our camels and a last backsheesh to our drivers and to say good-bye forever to these faithful creatures that had carried and guided us so quietly across the desert. We picked up a few more shells from synaptic sands. Then we mounted, each of us, the shoulders of one of the aforesaid mermen and were safely deposited on board. Our dog had watched all these proceedings with the utmost attention. He seemed much attached to us, and some of our party were inclined to acclimatize him in England. The journey indeed was a doubtful difficulty, but we all agreed to put the dog on trial. If he were brave enough to swim out to the boat, he would be taken on board. We looked at the dog, and the dog looked at us. We called and whistled. He barked and whined. He put his feet in the water, but drew them back again, and suddenly he turned away from the shore and trotted contentedly inland, 
probably to join the flesh pots of another caravan. Meanwhile, we set sail and tacked slowly to and fro, but the barge was heavily laden. Moreover, it leaked, and bailing with a tin pot seemed to be the order of the day. Several times we touched the bottom, and at length, midway between Asia and Africa, we ran gently aground on a sandbank. Instantly, half a dozen of our men were overboard, with the water up to their armpits, trying to shove us off, and the sails were strained to the utmost that the wind might help to set us free. But soon all efforts were deemed fruitless until the turning of the tide, and a small boat was hailed to take off the passengers. More rowing than sailing, we neared the shore, but within a hundred yards of the quay we stuck once more fast in the mud. This time we were hauled off by ropes, amid the cheering of an excited crowd that had collected to clamor for backsheesh. Our table at the hotel was covered with letters and papers from England, and ere long we were once more steeped in the social and political interests of the West. It felt strange and stuffy that night to sleep between brick walls. Our little room had no window, only a glass door opening into the public yard that had to be shut and bolted, and did not allow the fresh air of the desert to breathe on our pillows. We had hoped to rest a few days at Suez and go up the canal, but a telegram from Alexandria warned us that the café in which we had taken our passage was bound to leave on the morrow. So, packing in haste and taking a hurried farewell of our fellow travelers and of Ahmed, my husband and myself started at 2 p.m. by a slow train for Benha, a station on the main line, to wait there for the night mail from Cairo. We halted at many a little station in the desert, but never long enough to get out or to obtain any kind of refreshment, until we stopped finally several hours after sunset at Benha, or rather at the station called by that name, some ten minutes walk from the place itself. The offices and waiting rooms were closed for the night, as the mail train was not due before two in the morning, and the other passengers had quickly dispersed. A sleepy porter took possession of our luggage and deposited it under an open shed. Then he put out the lights and retired to his lair, and we two were left tired and hungry to shift for ourselves in this unknown land. Fortunately, the moon was bright, and the sound of laughter and singing reached us from the town, where the pious observers of Ramadan were keeping their nightly feast. So we wandered hand in hand through the balmy night air, and over the silver sand towards the colored lamps in front of the cafes, where the men sat drinking and smoking, while the dancing girls performed and the storytellers spun their long yarns. We passed by some of the noisier groups and sat down in a quiet corner where the little waiter, unsolicited, at once served us with coffee. We made him understand that we were hungry, but he only brought us another can full of coffee, and when we straightway asked him for bread, he looked at us with wandering eyes. This was neither the place nor the time for eating, yet he gave us a large, coarse lump, evidently a piece of his own private loaf, and we had a substantial meal of bread and coffee, the charge for both together being one piaster. But I believe the man made us pay for the coffee alone, and looked on the bread as a charitable gift to needy wayfarers. Amused and refreshed, we retraced our steps to sit on our luggage, dozing and dreaming, and waiting for the train. At its approach, the little station awoke, the lamps were lit, and beggars, porters, and hawkers of every kind appeared in vast superfluity. The train was crowded. We found but scant accommodation and had to sit bolt upright for the rest of the night on narrow wooden benches, much less comfortable than our boxes and rugs in the little shed at Benha. The sun was rising above the wide waters of the Nile as we came to Alexandria. Before we could get out of the carriage, we were surrounded and seized by clamorous cabmen, by touts, 
guides, and dragomans, who would not let us stir without their assistance. But we had learned something during these three months in the east. We recovered our property from their clutches, secured an arabilla, and rolled quickly away to the harbor, one of the largest harbors in the world, with miles of piers, quays, and breakwaters, and with the flags of all nations flying from innumerable mastheads. After much directing and misdirecting, our driver found the wharf of the P&O Company, and a few minutes later we were installed in a comfortable cabin and enjoyed an excellent breakfast. As our boat was not to leave before noon, we paid another visit to the far-famed town, the creation of Alexander the Great, the theater of Cleopatra's conquests, the earliest high school of Christianity, and now the chief emporium of our commerce with the East. It was this latest aspect that most interested us just now, and in the beautiful but entirely modern place Mehemet Ali, we easily found a banker and a shoemaker to minister to our wants. Since our last mountain scramble, I had been reduced to a pair of velveteen slippers. Punctually at twelve o'clock, we threw off the ropes, but it took several hours of starting and stopping, of backing and turning, before we got free of the crowded shipping and steamed past the high lighthouse on the outer bar. And then, all at once, as by magic, the long, low coast of Egypt sank below the water, and we were alone on the blue Mediterranean. A light breeze hardly rippled the surface, and the blue turned to purple and rosy red as the sun neared the horizon. We were walking up and down the deck, but felt more like walking on the pier of some seaside resort, so steady was the steamer. It was Easter Eve, and a prayer meeting went on in the second-class saloon on the lower deck. The skylights were open, and leaning over the railing, we caught the sweet strains of an old English hymn, just as the golden disc dipped beneath the waves and darkness overshadowed the earth. The glory of the day had departed, but we were not left comfortless. Already the east was beginning to brighten, and slowly the full moon mounted into the sky, silvering each tiniest ripple and pouring a river of jewels across the slumbering sea. The sun indeed had set for the night, but his light lived on in the moonbeams and abode with us in our narrow cabins below until the day broke and the shadows fled away and a glorious Easter morning rose above the world. End of chapter 7 End of Our Journey to Sinai by Agnes Bensley